Okay, cool, cool, cool. All right, so first of all, it's great to, to be up here with you guys. I, I think I met everybody last night, pretty much, for the most part. Um, and I've been getting lots of great questions. So here's what I'll tell you. Seth and I are going to be here through, what, tomorrow night, Monday night? Yep. So we're here. So grab us on breaks, ask anything you want. And I've, and I've tabled certain questions for this presentation because some questions have come up. And if it applies to everybody, then I say, you know, ask it from the room because they're great questions to ask. If you ask me something that really isn't applicable to everybody but is very specific to you, if you don't mind, we'll probably table that. And we can talk about it offline, okay, just to make the, the highest of us use of our time. So, so what I'm going to share with you is how to create a fortune, a real estate empire, and rescue your retirement using one secret tip. Now, I talked to Mike about this in terms of how to kind of prepare for this presentation. And what I want to do is kind of take a step back and get back to like a high level. Why are we doing what we're doing? Because we can get very granular, and I'm happy to do that. Uh, Oftentimes, though, we, we, we kind of, of, of miss the big picture because we get so caught up in some of the minute details. So I always like to start with a reminder of why are we doing this in the first place, okay? Now, let me just give you a quick example and, and, um, of why this is such an important topic. And as we get more into the presentation, I'll, I'll, I'll weave some of these things in. But to me, the self-directed IRA is like a technology, right? In fact, it's like my iPhone. So this iPhone, I can use it to make phone calls, right? But if that's all I use it for, I'm missing out on most of the functionality of this device. And the self-directed IRA is the exact same thing. So the more you know how to use it and the more you take advantage of it, the more it can do for you. So I'm totally focused on application and I think that's one of the things that separates us from some of our competition is that we focus on the platform and how to maximize that platform for you your business and your family, okay? So, so that's, what, that's what we're gonna be talking about. Um, I'll show you how to make more money in the next 30 days and never, ever, ever pay taxes again. Now, I know this is a pretty astute group, so, so I'll ask the question just to find out, is there anybody who doesn't believe that that's possible to never pay taxes? Is there anybody who doesn't believe that's possible? You guys all know that you can do that. On my arm. It, huh? Yeah, with, with it, using the right kind of tools. Okay. Um, I'll show you how to pay yourself instead of paying the government. A lot of people don't realize that they have a choice. And, and we really do have a choice in terms of how we manage our taxes. And, and I'll show you how to do that. I'll walk you through the simple three-step process that lets the money roll in while the freedom rolls out. Okay. Uh, uh, we'll you know, there's a lot of things we can talk about. For the sake of time, I'm going to kind of focus my time and attention on the things that you guys want to focus on. So there may be some things in here that I'm going to just kind of skip through. Um, how to double your monthly retirement income. I can spend some time on that if that's of interest to you. If not, we can just skip that part. Anybody want to hear about that? Yeah, sure. Okay. Yeah, yeah. I'll show you how we did that with one particular client. Uh, one of the things that gets me most excited is how to transform your family legacy. So, so self-directing, the, the real benefits of self-directing is that it can transform your current income as investors, I'll show you how to do that and show you some of the ways that works, but also the bigger picture, right? It, it is to transform our complete family legacy. We can do things and, and people will accomplish things with these strategies that they never thought were possible. And, and that's really what gets me excited because I'm guessing that you're sitting in this room with me for some of the people that aren't in this room with us, right? The people who are most important to us in our lives. And, and that's what drives me. I'm guessing that's what drives you. That's what drives most of my friends and my clients. And so that's what we're gonna be talking about. So that's the disclosure. Everybody knows what that says, right? I'm not an attorney. I'm not a CPA. I'm not going to give tax advice. I'm not going to give legal advice. I'm not even going to give any investment advice. What I am going to do is give you some great information, okay? But don't hold me accountable in any way. How's that? <laughs> so, so, uh, so, here's, so let's start with this. There was a, uh, anybody remember what your IRAs were introduced, traditional IRAs? 1974. 1974, exactly right. 1974. When were Ross introduced? 98. So, so Ross, or I'm sorry, so traditionals came out in 74. And here's what happened. You know, the government's great on think tank and research and, 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 and publishing reports. I have, I have one up here with me that just came out uh, recently. But one of the things that happened was Social Security said, you know what? We want to go back and test conventional wisdom. We want to see how this worked out. Because what we told people to do, right? There was this thing called ERISA that got introduced and they created retirement plans. And so they said, you know what, we, here's what we told people to do. We told them to go to school, get a good job, contribute to the company sponsor plan, and you give it enough time, when you retire, everything's going to be okay, right? You're going to get, you're going to be able to buy your own gold watch because the pensions are going away. And so that, that's what they told us all to do. So Social Security said a few years back, they said, okay, well, 
how did that work out? Right? How, how did that play out for people? Let's take a look at it. So that's where they commissioned this study. So if IRAs were introduced in 1974, what year did we just complete? 16. 16. So how many years of history do we have? More, yeah, about 42 years of history. So we have about 40 years of history when they looked at this. So, so you're not talking about a short period of time. So here's how they kind of conducted the study. They said, we're going to take 100 people at the start of our working career, we're going to follow them to retirement. For purposes of this study, they defined it as age 65. They said, how did that work out? And here's, here's one of the conclusions of the study. Only five out of those 100 people were financially secure by age 65. Five out of 100. Does that surprise anybody? Okay, think about it in another way. What they're basically saying is that 95% of Americans failed, absolutely failed, to create any kind of financial security in their lifetime. Now the question is, why is that? Right? That's the most important question that we can ask. Why did that happen? Well, there's three forces working against people in this study. They're the same three forces that are working against you and I. First one is uncertainty and unpredictability. Second one is expensive loads, fees, and commissions. Third one is taxes. Okay? We're just going to touch on these one at a time. Here's, what, here's the reality for most Americans. Now, I'm showing this to you guys for two reasons. Understand that this is what most people do. But if you, who here is looking to raise private money or does, works with private money? Okay, so here's another thing that I want you guys to keep in mind. For those of you working with private money, now I, I fund projects, I fund investments. Uh, last year, I raised 1.2 million. I uh, started a project. It, I started raising the money in February 1 of we're 16 last year. Finished that fundraising June 30th. Okay, raised 1.2 million dollars, all private money. About half came from IRAs or retirement accounts, right? The other half was outside of retirement accounts. As investors, we don't care where the money comes from, do we? We just care that we get it. But IRAs present a huge opportunity if you're looking for private money, and we'll get into that. Understand this is your competition if you're out there raising private money. Mm -hmm. If you're not doing the kinds of things that Mike is talking about, this is what you're, you're stuck with. So that's why this is kind of important to understand, okay? There's effectively two things that people invest in, inside or outside of a retirement account. And the first one is something called stable value, right? Or fixed income, as you'll hear it called. So stable value, anybody, anybody uh, does anybody here still have like a company-sponsored 401k? Anybody still in that? My wife. Your wife? Okay, so you'll see it called different things. It could be a money market, a fixed income fund. It can be different things. CDs, right, is a very common instrument in this category that people invest in. So what I did was I just took a snapshot, right, Chase Bank. You guys have Chase here? I mean, Chase is nationwide except in New Mexico. And I uh, can't figure that one out. So, so here's the deal. If, if you look at this chart, and, and uh, it's, it, I'll just kind of point it out to you. At the bottom, basically what it says is if you were to lock your money up, and let's say $100,000, I'm going to just use $100,000 to make the math simple this morning. $100,000 account, you were to lock it up for a year, you could get 0.02 to 0.05% on your money, right? Now, let me ask you something. Are you going to get rich on that? Not at all. Any, any private investor that you might be talking to, are they going to get rich on that? Not at all. So this is a strategy that I call going broke slowly, okay? And, and this is one of the things that happened to the people in the Social Security report. Why do I call it going broke slowly? Because of inflation, right? People don't want to see that principle right, move around, so, so they go with something like this. The problem is, is that $100,000 next year isn't going to spend the same as $100,000 today, right? That's the problem. So that's why I call it going broke slowly. Now, just so you know, you know I'm not trying to slight the deck here because one of the things I always point out to people is I try to be more than fair about these things. I am not showing you Chase's crappy rates for their customers, okay? I'm showing you their great rates for their customers. This is as good as it gets, guys, okay? I am not sliding the deck. Now, the question is, why do people choose to go broke slowly? Because it is a choice where we put our money. It's our choice what we do. And the answer is, the reason why people choose to go broke slowly is they're afraid of going broke quickly. Which is the other option, because what do most people do? They put it in mutual funds that are tied to the stock market. Now, uh, this is a chart of the S&P 500, and by the way here, anybody ever worked with financial advisor before? Uh, okay, so I started out my career as a financial advisor. I came from the Wall Street world and, and migrated into this world uh, for, for a whole lot of reasons. But one of the things that we always told clients was that slow and steady wins the race. Slow and steady wins, have you guys heard that before? Mm -hmm. Well, let's break that down for a second. Okay, let's take the slow part. How long did Social Security look at for purposes of their study? 
about 40 years. Okay, I don't know how you get any slower than that. Okay, I don't have much more time than that if I'm trying to create wealth. So, right, slow doesn't necessarily hold true. What about the steady part? And this is really the problem. Does that look steady to you? It sure doesn't look steady to me. So can slow and steady win the race? It sure can, but that's not what the stock market or Wall Street has to offer us. And so this is the problem of uncertainty and unpredictability. This is what is and I'll tell you, when I was in the advisory world and dealing with these assets, I had clients who were, I, I'll never forget, I had clients who, uh, in fact, I worked for uh, Payne, uh, UBS, the private client wealth group, and I had clients who were two years away from retirement, worked for P&G in Cincinnati, Ohio, bought a horse farm in Kentucky, right? That was their dream to retire on this horse, horse farm. Two years before retirement, stock market blew up, this was 2000, right? And they had to put off their retirement plans indefinitely. That's what we mean by uncertainty and unpredictability. This is the problem. We have no control over it, okay? So that's problem number one. Um, problem number two, expensive loads, fees, and commissions. This is important for people to understand, particularly if you're raising, and again, I'm going to kind of weave this in, if you're raising private money, these are important things to be able to know. Um, so the second problem, expensive fees, loads, and commissions. Here's how traditional financial institutions typically work, okay? They charge fees, and if I were to ask you what you paid for your retirement account, and if you were to ask people, you wouldn't know, right? Because you get a statement at the end of the year, but nobody puts the fees on there. That's what we call hidden fees. There's a reason why they hide them, okay? It's because they're large, and people would revolt if you actually saw what people, if you were paying. So there's a company, or there's a group out there called the ICI, the Investment Company Institute. They're a financial research organization. They publish every year something called their investment company factbook, but they do a lot of great research. It's, most of it's available for free online. Okay? So here's basically what they're saying in this chart. There's a maximum front end sales load. So in other words, if you have an IRA or retirement account, you were to go from one financial institution to another, a traditional type of financial institution. If you're working with a, a private investor, same thing, right? They go from, from the bank like Chase to UBS where I used to work. You can pay upfront loads plus ongoing fees and commissions. What this chart says is that the average person could pay up to 5.4%. Okay? So we're going to put this in dollars and cents real fast. Somebody has a $100,000 IRA just for making a movement to a new firm. They could pay $5,400 first year in, in loads and commissions plus ongoing fees of $1,500 on average according to the ICI. That's $6,900 their very first year. So the first thing you got to think about, right, you got either no yield in the marketplace currently or you got the volatility of the market. That's the first problem. Then you throw in expensive loads, fees, and commissions, right? That starts to, I mean, think about it. Somebody has to be up about $7,000 in the market just to get to zero just for moving the account, right? So that's problem number two, right? Now, problem number three is that if somebody actually makes any money, right, then we throw in taxes. And at this point, you're probably wondering why Mike invited me to come here and talk to you guys this morning. <laughs> but don't worry, it's going to get better. So here's the problem with taxes. When we earn income, and that's what we call it, earn income, so depending upon how you're investing or how you're making your money, if you get a W-2, a 1099 typically, right, something, depending upon the type of 1099, uh, income from self-employment, then we're paying earned income taxes. What can we pay? Federal, state, local, Medicare, Social Security, right? You start adding those all up. What does that mean to you and I in terms of dollars? Now, here's what that means. If you make $100,000 a year, as an example, you could be paying $42,200 a year to various taxing authorities. Now, does that tick anybody off? I mean, I mean whose money is that? That's, I mean, isn't that your money? That's my money. I mean, we're the ones out there hustling and earn it. We're, we're coming and getting educated. We're getting trained. We're taking risks, right? We're putting deals. We're making things happen. And it's being unloaded from us. Okay? So let me ask you this question. If I could show you how to keep that $42,000, would that be beneficial to you? Okay? So that's what really, what we're really talking about here. Understand, this is the big picture. This is what's at stake. Because it is nearly impossible to create wealth with this kind of thing hanging over us. Let me ask you a quick question. 
Who's the wealthiest person that you can think of? First name that comes to mind. What would you say? Buffett? Gates. Gates. Oprah. 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 <laughs> the Queen of England. The Queen of England. <laughs> you're the closest. Oh. Yeah, actually. Here's the thing. That, those are the names that I always get. But do you know who the wealthiest Americans were? It's not Gates, and it ain't Buffett. It's J.P. Morgan. It's Andrew Carnegie. It's Rockefeller. It's Vanderbilt. What didn't they have back then? They didn't have income tax. That's why they were able to build universities, right? And these palaces, right? A, a summer palace that they go to for a month out of the year. I mean, that's where the money came from. Okay, income tax changed everything. And that's why they introduced the income tax, right? They used those guys to say, it ain't fair that these guys have all this and people are scraping by, so that's how they sold income tax to America. And so now we're all paying the bill. So the reality is, is that you can look at the, 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 even the uber wealthy, and the uber wealthy of today does not compare to the uber wealthy of yesterday, and this is the reason why. It's because of taxes. So you take those three things, you take the volatility, the unpredictability of the market, you take high fees, commissions, and loads, you layer in taxes if there's anything made. Do you guys want to see what the average American's retirement plan really looks like? You ready for this? Yeah. Welcome to Walmart. <laughs> and I don't mean to make light of that, but isn't that true? And, and here's the reality of it. People work at Walmart not because they want to, right? It's because they don't understand this. Nobody took the time to explain this to them. So even if they understood the problem, they, which they don't even understand that, they don't have a solution to it. So let's solve the problem. And I'll tell you, this is why I say it's no wonder the families can't seem to get ahead today. Okay, so this has happened to you or someone you know. Uh, I want you to know it's, 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 it's not your fault because nobody takes the time to break this down. Now, I'm just going to give you a, a real brief background on myself uh, because I've been doing this for, for 23 plus years. And... I said, I was telling somebody, wasn't you? Yeah, so he asked how long I've been in the business. I said 23 plus years because what I realized was my marketing folks said, well, the more you're in the business, the more credibility you have. So every year I used to update that slide. Then I realized I'm just dating myself. So I put plus after 23. Yeah. 10 years from now, I have 23 plus years experience in this business. Okay, that's it. It's never changing. Uh, I founded uh, and I'm CEO of Specialized IRA Services. We're a self-directed IRA provider. You, a lot of you guys already know what a self-directed provider is. I've been getting some specific questions. You can ask those later. Uh, I've written several books on it. In fact, we have books on the way, by the way. They were supposed to be here by now. Uh, but you'll get those Tuesday, it sounds like, if you're here Tuesday, because that's when they're going to get delivered. Um, but, uh, but I've been doing this for a while. By, by way of, of quick background, I, by the way, did anybody see the video that Mike and I did when we were online? I know Mike saw it. You, you, he was part of it. Did anybody else see the video that we did? One person? No? Okay, so, so let me give you, because there's a lot of things I could say. I'll, I'll, I'll show you this quick story with you. I, I got my first start investing back in middle school, junior high actually, because I grew up, when I was growing up, I was raised by my mom, single mom, and it was my sister and I. She didn't make a lot of money. She was a parole officer for uh, the state of Ohio, and she went to Ohio State University, the Ohio State University. Where they're, they're very particular about that, by the way, when you go there. And so... Uh, my grandfather always complained about that. You go to Ohio State and you get a degree and you go into something that makes you no money, you know. And, and that was the problem. She didn't make any money as a, as a social worker, as a parole officer working for the state of Ohio. So we would go to the grocery store and she wasn't sure how she was going to buy groceries sometimes. Like she didn't know if the check was going to clear, right? And, that, that, and we were in tow. And so I knew when I grew up, I did not want to be in that situation. I did not want to worry about how I was going to feed my kids. So I wanted to do something different. Now, I was in sixth grade at the time that this kind of struck me, and I didn't know what to do, but I knew money had something to do with it. So I just started doing odd jobs. I'd do anything that somebody would pay me to do. Shovel, you know, driveways, rake leaves, mow lawns. It didn't matter. I would do whatever somebody would do to pay me. I ended up saving that money, and so by the time I got into middle school, I opened up uh, what was called an UGMA account. Anybody know what an UGMA account is? It's under the Uniform Gift to Minor. It's basically a brokerage account. Okay, but because I was under the age of 18, I'm not allowed to enter into a legally binding financial contract myself, so I had to have a custodian, in this case my grandfather, okay, on that account. So I saved up some money, I put it in that account, 
And now I'm looking for my very first investment, right? Lo and behold, I found it. Now when I tell you what it is, you cannot laugh. You have to remember, I was in junior high at the time. I bought stock in a company called Chuck E. Cheese. Okay? Now, that's the company that is parents or grandparents, right? We love it, we hate it, all at the same time. But here's the deal. I bought that stock at $18 a share, actually 18 and a quarter. Okay? 12 months later, it went to $42 a share. I learned a very valuable lesson. The money, the wealth is created investing. I made more money in one year investing than I did working a crap, crap jobs for a year. Okay, so I said, the money's in investing. It ain't, it ain't in working and doing crap jobs. So I went to my grandfather and I said, Grandpa, we're gonna sell, I wanna sell this stock. What do you think he said? Don't sell it, why not? He's old, stocks are for the long run, right? Isn't that what we're told? Stocks are for the long, everything's for the long run, right? So he says, no, we're not going to sell it. It's for the long run. I said, well, Grandpa, I'm not going to go buy a toy with the money. You know, I just want to well, invest it in something else. I didn't, ha I didn't know anything about cell discipline back then. Okay? I just knew it went up a lot. I'll sell it and we'll invest it in something else. That's all I knew. He says, no, we're not going to do that. Something that people are not aware of. So Chuck E. Cheese ends up filing bankruptcy. Now, under certain types of bankruptcy, the judge will allow the company to wipe out all existing shareholders and issue new company stock as part of the recapitalization or restructuring plan. That's what happened to me. So Chuck E. Cheese exists today, but I no longer have an interest in the company because my financial interest got wiped out completely. I went from 18 to 42 to zero virtually overnight. That's the problem with the market. Now, but here's the thing. I learned a lot of lessons back then, but that started my investing career, and that's really what got me going. Um, the thing that really drives me uh, to do all this and to get out there and teach it and share it is this little girl right there. That's my daughter, Katie. Um, that's, our, that's my favorite time of year is the daddy-daughter dance. And so, you know, I knew, because here's the reality of it, guys. If we're not doing this ourselves, if we're not practicing this, if we don't understand it fundamentally, and who's going to teach our kids? Okay, I'm very active in my kids' education, and the schools don't get this. They're never going to get it, right? They're never going to get it. But I knew from the time she was five that she was going to need a very good financial education because Katie's favorite thing to do is to go shoe shopping with Daddy, okay, from the time she was five years old. The only thing that ever scared me more than that was the fact that her mommy's favorite thing to do was to go shoe shopping without Daddy, yeah. right? Um, I've got three boys as well, so I've got four kids. By the way, I figured out what causes that. Okay, there won't be a fifth child. I've taken care of that. But... Slow learner. <laughs> slow learner, that's right. Yeah, yeah, we won't get into that story. Anyway, um, but yeah, so you know what? I mean, this is the whole thing. So this is why we do that. And that's why I say legacy is very important to me because we can not only change our own financial lives, but we can change our downline, okay? And that's what this is all about. So what's the solution? You know what? Here's the cool thing about it. The solution is pretty darn simple. It ain't complicated, okay? I'll just say it's not common, okay? And it does require a little work. So. Here, here, here's the simple solution to creating wealth. I mean, this is really what it boils down to. First of all, we've got to eliminate taxes. Now, reducing or deferring taxes is very beneficial, but would you agree if we could just eliminate them all together, that's the best thing to do? Okay. So, second thing is we want to eliminate expensive commissions and fees. You do that with a self-directed IRA. I know a lot of you already have self-directed IRA, so you understand the difference between what you pay in fees for a self-directed account, which is significantly less than what you're going to pay to a Wall Street firm, right? And then we eliminate uncertainty. How do we eliminate uncertainty? It's by investing in things that you know about, right? That you understand. So everything you guys are doing here with the notes and everything else, right? You can do that all inside of a retirement account. When you bring those three things together, that's how we really begin to change our picture. Um, so a self-directed IRA allows you to do all that. So let's talk about it. So, so let me just kind of put in perspective what I think this is all about. Because a lot of people, again, they lose sight of it. When I work with clients, we do some consulting work. And when, we do some consul and when, we, when I work with clients, it's not uncommon that a client will say to me, you know what, Edwin, I want, my goal is to have a $2 million Roth IRA. My first question is, why $2 million? Why not one and a half? Why not two and a half? They usually say, well, it's a nice round number. So yeah, it's not a real goal. 
Okay, well, let's put this in perspective because a, a lump sum of money doesn't really do much for you. Okay, and let me, let me show you why. Here's the question. What does it take to generate $100,000 a year for the rest of your life? Would you say that's a pretty good result? Mm -hmm. Is that something that would be worth working for? And I know some of you in this room say, well, I want way more than that. And that's fine. You can plug in your own number. But what we're looking at is a consistent, predictable income stream that we can't outlive. Mm -hmm. right? That's really what it boils down to. So what does it take to do that? Because understand, 95% of Americans out there haven't gotten it done. They haven't, figured, they haven't dialed it in. They haven't figured it out. They're not doing it. It's not happening for them. So the question is, you know, what does it take to do that? Well, let me just give you a simple scenario. And I can, I can show you all kinds of scenarios to, to, to show you how this plays out for you. But, but let me just give you a simple one. Because one of the questions I got earlier was, well, when's the best time to open up a Roth IRA? When's the best time to get started with something like this? Well, here's the answer. It was last year. But if you didn't start last year, then the answer is today. Why is that the answer? Well, don't take my word for it. It's based on the math. Okay, if you were to take 5,000 a year, and I'm telling you that people spend 5,000 a year at Starbucks, okay, people who wait tables at P.F. Chang spend $5,000 a year at Starbucks. Anyone can save, you want, $5,000 a year, okay? You invest that, or you save it for 5,000 a year for 30 years if you get 10% on your money. By the way, 10%, how easy or hard is it to get 10% on your money pretty consistently? Easy? <coughs> Difficult? For most, people, For most people, impossible. When you step into this world, it becomes very possible, right? So who's here? So, so I saw if you, who's here raising private money. Okay, if I had a hundred thousand dollars, I was willing to back your next deal. Would you pay me ten percent of my money? I'm paying ten and twelve right now yeah. for some people. Okay, so ten percent ain't hard. See that? That's my point. You you don't have to walk out of this room. I mean, or I should say, you can walk out of this room and start making money immediately. That's the cool thing about being in this room. You can walk out of this room and start making money instantly okay with the with the network and everything you guys are learning right here so 10 percent is very doable in this world that's the whole point so 5,000 for 30 years at 10 percent will grow to nine hundred ninety one thousand dollars now that means nothing because here's the problem if you spend that you're gonna get down to zero you've got nothing right so we can't do that but what can we spend what can we spend you can spend the interest. You can spend the income off your assets. That's the difference between wealth and earned income. Wealth is where you have assets that <coughs> provide you income. Earned income is where you're out hustling for it. We want to be able to make the choice to transition away from one and to the other. Would you agree? That's what this is all about. So if we're making 10% on that money, that's $99,000 a year. And if you're spending that from a Roth, how much do you pay in income tax? How much do you pay in capital gains tax? It's better than moving to Puerto Rico, okay, right? I mean, you can live wherever you want. So, so $99,000 a year tax-free. That's, that's what I mean. This is simple stuff. It isn't complicated, but you've got to implement it. You've got to do it. So I'm going to explode some myths today, and one of them is that you can't do that inside of an IRA, right? You guys will hear that. Now, this is one of the things that I've been getting a lot of questions about. What can I and can I do? Or where do you draw the lines? The interesting thing is, and I'm going to tell you, we all want to be cognizant of prohibited transaction rules and laws and all those kinds of things. But right here, I just thought I'd share this with you since we were talking about it last night at dinner. This is a report from the General Accounting Office. Okay, this just came out. And it's titled, Retirement Security. Improved guidance could help account owners understand the risk of investing in unconventional assets. This is a basically a report that was commissioned by the, the Senate Finance Committee okay, on self-directed retirement accounts. So we, one of the things I mentioned to a couple people last night is that I have the opportunity sitting in my seat running this company, uh, being, uh, uh, you know, we're being one of the leaders in the industry that I meet with all the policymakers. Right? I go to DC several times a year. We meet with the Treasury, uh, the IRS. We meet um, with the DOL, Department of Labor who oversees the company sponsor plan side, the QRPs, right? General Accounting Office, I was on the phone with them. Uh, you know, I, they have my personal email address. And so we correspond with all the Treasury Department, right? We correspond with these people. So we know where their mind is at. We know what their concerns are. The interesting thing is, is that there's two main things that the government's concerned about when it comes to self-directing and non-conventional assets. And it's right here in their summary. And the funny thing is, it has nothing to do with prohibited transactions. It has everything to do with how they make their money. 
So there are two big concerns are monitoring for ongoing federal tax liability. Two ways you trigger a tax inside of a retirement account. Anybody know what they are inside of an IRA? That's what it's called. UBTI is the tax that you would trigger. There's two ways to trigger a tax inside of a retirement account. Anybody know? Or IRA, let me be specific. Two ways you can do that. Anybody know how to do it? That's the tax. It's two things. One is borrowing inside of an IRA. It's not prohibit to borrow money inside of an IRA, but it is taxable. The second thing is owning and operating a business inside of a retirement account, IRA. Wow. It is not prohibited, but it is taxable. That's what they're concerned about. That's number one. The second thing that they're concerned about, obtaining annual fair market valuations for non-publicly traded assets. Because we talked, about, I talked to a couple of people, right? they, they want their tax revenue. That's what they care about. That's the two big things on their, their list. Okay. So, so we're going to talk. Can you give an example of uh, borrowing inside the IRA? But if I buy a house inside my IRA and you lend money to my IRA to purchase the house, so I have a mortgage on the house, is that encumbered? Is that asset encumbered? It is, right? That's leveraged. That's what triggers the UDFI or the UBIT tax. UDFI is a subset of UBIT, okay? Here's the thing. Is it really legal to do a lot of the stuff we're talking about, specifically to buy real estate? So the answer is you've got to go to the source. I source everything. You're going to hear a lot of people give you opinions on this stuff. Um, I have my, my own, but I, I think I'm probably one of the most accurate and sane people in the industry. I say that with absolutely no bias at all. Um, <laughs> But, but I take stances that I think I can back up with actual sources, and that's why I do what I, that's why I, I take the positions I take, okay? So first thing is, is that we always have to go to the source. And when it comes to the IRA side of the house, right, the IRS is the enforcement agency on retirement accounts. So they're the ones that we want to look to for guidance, right? So this is their website, IRA FAQs, right? And if we scroll to the bottom of the page, it says, there's a question on the page that says, is there anything, any restrictions on the things that I can invest my IRA in? It goes on to say, yes, as a matter of fact, there are, right? It gives us some examples, artwork, rugs, antiques, right, collectibles. But now they gave us this example, and this is really important because I was get, one of the questions I got last night was, what's the difference between you and some of your competitors, right? So I'm going to answer part of that right here. Here's the example the IRS gave us. It says IRA trustees. Now, who's the IRA trustee? In the IRA world, the trustee is whoever holds the financial institution that holds your retirement account. Okay, so the IRA trustees, IRA trustees are permitted to impose additional restrictions on investments. For example, because of administrative burdens. Okay, which is kind of code for Wall Street hasn't figured out how to charge you a, a crap pot full of money right, if you're putting together your own investments, right? Many IRA trustees do not permit IRA owners to invest IRA funds in real estate. But, look at this. Last sentence. IRA law does not prohibit investing in real estate, but trustees are not required to offer real estate as an option. So there's a lot of people out there that will tell you you, just, you can't do certain things, and they're just flat wrong. You just got to send them right back to the source. Okay? Particularly for those of you guys who are working with private investors, right? financial advisors will do everything in their power to talk people out of moving their money. Right? Because they have a lot at stake. We just saw that. Right? Their fees and their commissions go away when a client leaves them. So they will do everything in their power to scare somebody out of investing with you or self-directing. So it's important to just understand this stuff. And the, what, you know, the, the, I cannot tell you how many advisors tell clients when they're moving money over, you can't do that. Right. Uh, I can show you where they're wrong. You know? I mean, so at any rate, so just, just be aware. You wanna, you, we always want to go back and, and source everything that we do. Um, so I'm, I'm going to touch on a couple of quick examples. I'm going to, and I'm not going to go on all these with you, but I, I'll, I'll just touch on these again because I want to give you a, a big picture thing. Now, what a lot of folks will do, particularly standing at the front of the room, is that they'll give you case studies of students or clients and things of that nature. And, I, and, I, and we can do that. And I can, we can talk through clients and, and some things that we've helped people do. But again, I want to give you a bigger picture because this is really what's at stake. The reason why I stepped into the self-directed IRA world is what I'm about to show you. Okay, when I was in, in the Wall Street world, I started out, like most advisors, working with people who had $50,000 to invest or whatever they had and to get in the 401k rollover and that kind of thing. But ultimately, I ended up working with very wealthy individuals and families, ended up getting recruited away from UBS to go work for a firm where 
financial institutions, high-end financial institutions were all my clients. One of my clients was Bank of New York. So if you're familiar with BNY, that was, one, that was on my client list, right? When I stepped into that world, I saw something very, very different than what we were telling people with $50,000 to do, okay? And that all came from the fact that wealthy people and institutions had figured this stuff out decades ago. So the one thing I always tell people is that it might be new to some people, but it's not new at all. This has been around for a long, long time, okay? Um, one of the best examples that came out was Mitt Romney's IRA, right? So you guys all remember when Mitt Romney ran for president, right? When somebody runs for president, what do they do? They release their financials. Well, typically, what do people do? They release their financials, right? Most do. Most do. So when Romney released his financials, what happened was they, uh, Bloomberg wrote this article and they called it the secret behind Romney's magical IRA. Now, the reason why they did that was they, a couple of reasons. First of all, he had the account for 15 years, okay? He had grown that account to $101.2 million. And so people said, well, wait a minute, how do you grow an IRA to $100 million, right? That's unheard of. And so that's why they wrote the article. But here's the, and one of the reasons why they asked that question is because they said, you know, how did he do it given the relatively small amounts that the law permits people to contribute to an account? Now that's an important point there. Okay, I want to make that point. A lot of people confuse, and I know this is a different kind of room, a lot of people confuse how much money you're allowed to make in the account versus how much money you contribute to an account. Some people are under the mistaken idea, I can only make 5,000 in the account a year, right? No, that's a contribution limit. That's not, this is the best case for this. Earnings are limitless, right? Whatever you can make, you get to make. So, so that's the real benefit of self-directing. Now, see, this is the thing. The secret wasn't magic. The secret is a self-directed IRA. That's what Romney used to get control of his money and invest in things that he knew and understood. By the way, what was he investing in? You know what he did at Bain Capital. Well, when he was doing his own personal investing, he was doing the same kinds of things, but he was doing it in a self-directed IRA. Let me just tell you, Romney has been audited. That retirement account has been audited. I can't tell you that Romney is a client. I don't have permission to do that. I can tell you some of his family members are clients. Okay? They've given me permission to say that. And here's the thing. That account has been audited. Okay? He didn't pay taxes and nothing was prohibited. Now, what does that tell you? You see what I'm saying? There's a lot of fear mongering going on out there, but put it in perspective. It's about knowing how to do these things. Mike. So was, was Mitt Romney doing uh, the same type of business outside of his IRA as he was doing inside uh, his IRA? Here's, here's a, here's a, that's a great question, I'll, and I'm going to hone you in on words. He said, is he doing the same kind of business outside the IRA that he was doing inside the IRA? Here's the big difference, and this is why he didn't pay taxes. He wasn't doing any business in his IRA. He was investing. <coughs> Investments are never taxable inside of a retirement account. Businesses are always taxable inside of a retirement account. That's a very important distinction. So in my retirement account, I don't do anything other than investing. Make sense? Now the question is we get back to well, what defines an investment activity versus a business activity. We can, we, can, we can address those things, but understand, until pr somebody proves me wrong, everything I do is an investment activity inside of my retirement account, everything. Now there are times where people do businesses and, and there's times where I consult with clients and we'll say, set the business up inside the retirement account. There are legitimate times to do that uh, again, I can, we, can, we can talk about all that fun stuff, but, um, but that's the point. Now, one, one, one more. Let me give you a, another quick one here. Harvard's Endowment Fund has leveraged these principles for decades, and you can too. Here's the interesting thing. When I was in the institutional money management world, right, when we were, I mean, we were managing, like, I mean, we're talking billions of dollars in, in portfolios. I mean, we're not talking chump change here. We're not talking $50,000 accounts anymore. Thing is, in every industry, in every space, you always have your A players, right? So in the note space, right, Mike is that best practice that we look to. In the institutional world, one of the best practices we looked to was Harvard. Why Harvard? Okay, well, Har here's why. Let me show you why. This is the New York Times, July 18th, 1917. The new Harvard fund reaches one point, I'm going to call it $1.2 million. I'm just going to round up. $1.2 million, okay? That's the New York Times. Now, fast forward. 
right? 2016, it had grown to $36.4 billion. Now, I don't know what rate of return that is, but it's huge, right? It's enough. It's enough. It's enough. It's enough for me. The question is, how did Harvard do that? By the way, does everybody know what an endowment fund is? I don't want to assume that you know what an endowment fund is if you don't know what an endowment fund is. You got, okay, everybody knows what an endowment fund is. Okay, so how did Harvard do it? Well, here's the cool thing about it. Harvard did, it really boils down to three things. It boils down to three things, okay? Harvard, because I've studied this for a long time, Harvard self-directs. Now, what do I mean by that? Believe it or not, the reason why I had clients on the institutional side was because institutions don't make decisions vastly different than individuals do. Right? Most institutions, when they've got money, they hand it off to an advisor. They say, go take care of my money. That's what they do. And in fact, they put out RFPs and we would bid. And you, know, you bid for parts of the portfolio and those kinds of things. Well, what Harvard said was, when they set up this endowment fund, they said, you know what? Nobody cares more about our money than we do. Therefore, we can't hand it off to somebody arbitrarily. We have to take on For better or worse, we own it at the end of the day. Even if you hire an advisor to do this for you, you're making the decision on that advisor. You don't have the right, in my opinion, to go bitch about an advisor because we know what the stock market does. If, if your portfolio goes down because you hand it off to an advisor, well, who made the decision to hire the advisor? Who gave him permission to put it in the market in the first place? So stop whining and start doing something about it, right? Harvard knew that from the very beginning. They said, we're not going to hand this off to somebody. We can't afford to. Nobody cares more about our money than we do. So we have to own this. That's what I mean by self-directing. They set up something called the Harvard Management Company. That's how they oversee their own endowment fund. Okay? Second thing, Harvard's endowment fund makes tax-protected profits. Now, how can you and I duplicate tax-protected profits? Re retirement account. Right? That's it. Retirement account. And the third thing that they did, and the way that they were able to preserve money and grow it over a long period of time, that's a long period of time, is through alternative assets like real estate. Now, I hate that people call this an alternative asset because the last time I checked, right, land existed a little longer than the stock market did. <laughs> but whatever, right, well, I'm not going to argue the point. Um, but, but that's how it works. So Harvard did those three things. Look, I mean, Warren Buffett talks about Roth IRAs. He talks about real estate investing. I mean, this is not new stuff. This is the stuff that the wealthiest institutions, individuals, and families have been doing for decades. What we're talking about is adopting these same things. So I know, and the reason why I take the time to point this out to you guys is because, I, I, I mean, again, all the questions I've been getting since I've been here are very granular questions. And some people get a little frustrated at times where they say, you know what, this seems a little cumbersome or this, that, or the other thing. You know what, it's worth it. It's worth it to figure this out, dial it in, and implement it because this is what's at stake, right? These are the things that the wealthiest people are doing right now. And this is what has created their wealth. This is what allows them to preserve their wealth. So this is why I do it. That's why I got into it. Um, I'm not going to go through this because you guys all get that. Um, why specialized IRA services? Uh, you know what? I'll, I'll touch on a couple things here. And then it, again, like I said, you guys feel free to ask questions throughout the day or as we go on. But one of the things that separates us, I feel, from, from everybody else in the space is that I came from the advisory world. So we worked one-on-one -on -one with, with clients. I mean, that's what we did. And we worked on all kinds of a, uh, on aspects of their financial life. When I stepped into the self-directed world, the biggest challenge that I saw in the self-directed world was that is disjointed, right? Everything is disconnected in this world. And so people go to the IRA provider, and one of the reasons why clients move to us from other direct competitors, the mo one of the most common things I'll hear from clients is they say, well, you know, when I call my IRA provider, they say, look, all we want to know is where to send the check. Just tell us where to send the check. That's the number one thing as a client. They say, I get no support, I get help, no help, I get no guidance. And so that's one of the challenges. Self-directing does not mean that you have to go it alone. Okay, you can work with people who will help support you. Um, so with regards to specialized IRA services, we have different levels of support based on what clients are looking for. But here's the other thing. Self-directed does not mean the same thing to everybody. So as an example, there are people that are called self-directed IRA custodians, but all they do is hold precious metals as an example. So if you want to do notes, you can't do that there. If, and again, this has come up, uh, started coming up last night. One of the things that came up was, well, you know, your competitor here or here won't let me do this type of investment or hold it this way, take title this way. Okay, 
our philosophy is this. If it isn't prohibited, we're going to support you and allow you to do it. And, and I say that for a couple reasons. I don't view it as my job to play God over your financial life. That's supposed to be one of the big benefits of self-directing, that you have the opportunity to decide for yourself what's best for you. So if it's prohibited, we're not processing it. But short of it being prohibited, we will hold it. Okay, that's important because that business philosophy and somebody's business philosophy will permeate everything that you do. Let me give you a quick example. Company that I used to be with that I left. When you have a self-directed IRA, you pay a fee every year for your account, right? It's called an annual fee. Now, my philosophy is, and, and this varies from competitor to competitor, I have most of my competitors say, you know what? We're going to do what's best for us. My philosophy, because we want to make sure the owners are taken care of. My philosophy in setting up this company was, we're going to take care of the client. You take care of the client, the business will take care of the owners. We don't have to worry about that part. So how does that realistically play out? Let me give you just a simple example. Annual fee. Most of my competitors charge an annual fee, just like we do. No different. Here's the difference, though. You open your account with them today, they're going to rebill you that annual fee in January because they actually do it on a calendar year basis. Okay? So we just think that's not the right way to do it. If, you know, if you're going to start a long-term relationship, you have to do it on a ground of mutual respect. So although we could follow industry standard on that, we opted not to do that. So if you open an account in May, you don't pay that fee till next May. You get a full year service for a full year fee. Seems pretty straightforward, but again, that's just not how the, a lot of our competitors operate. Okay? My largest competitor, literally the only way to get a full year service for a full year fee is to open your account on January 1st, but you can't because their office is closed. Right? <laughs> But we will hold just about anything, like I said, and, and we support the clients. Now, we'll also give you the information. If you say, well, I'm not sure if this is a good idea or not, we can give you the good, the bad, and the ugly. But ultimately, you get to make your own decision. Um, we'll hold any type of asset. So we hold precious metals, we hold real estate, we hold notes. So it's important when you set this up to know that you're, you're, you're choosing somebody really for life, in my opinion. That's how I view the business. And we want to take good care of our clients and customers because what we know is that when you have success, you're going to refer family, friends, kids, right? Because we're talking about legacy strategies here today. All these things. So put some thought into who you're selecting and who you want to work with. But I would base it on, think about basing it on who do you share a common interest or philosophy in or with, right? That, that's very, very important because that's going to drive a lot of things. Um, Oftentimes, the reason why people can't get deals done is not, sometimes it's a service issue, but sometimes it's not. It's because they can't figure out if they want to hold it or not, right? So you submit an investment, and the company's evaluating and saying, well, we don't know if we want to do this or not. So what happens is it just doesn't get done, okay? You, you, you need to deal with people who know what they're doing and are decisive and can tell you what their business philosophy is on holding investments. That's another important thing to look for. So just be aware of those things. Um, with a specialized self-directed IRA, you can pay less taxes, you can pay no taxes. Now, you guys are pretty adept at this, so I'm not going to, I'll answer questions on some of this if you want. I'm going to pass these out, just take one. Here's what this is. This is uh, what I call my plan design chart. This is something I created, and I use it to train our staff. At events like this, I'll just hand it out. This has every account on here that you can self-direct currently. And one of the things that we do when we sit down with clients, and if this is something you're interested in, Seth would be happy to spend time with you on the phone doing this or, or at the event. Um, we can sit down and do this. But what we do is we'll sit down. We have something called the blueprint. You fill this out. You give it back. It's like a snapshot of your financial life. It gives us all the information we need to know to, to start talking to you about what you qualify for, how to set these things up. So we can actually create a custom plan design for you. Okay. Um, oh, here. Do you want to? There's some more. If you just want to handle straight back. Give him the mic and then he can just hold on to him. Uh, but this, this has all the different contribution limits, everything else. I will tell you this. I have clients using this tool here and having a conversation with them. I have clients who are putting away $150,000 a year and more into Roth accounts. Okay? So again, very, very useful tool. And we can, uh, you know, we can talk more about specific accounts and those kinds of things. Uh, if you want. You can self-direct, like I said, anything on this sheet. Now, here's, here's why this sheet, let me tell you how I put this together, and I'll give you at a high level how this works for you. 
You heard the, IR, the reason why our logo is at the top is not just because it makes it look pretty. It, it serves a purpose. Remember what the IRS said. Trustees, okay, trustees are a, a, allowed to impose additional restrictions on investments. So here's what that means. Any account you see here, so long as it's held at specialized, can be self-directed into any asset that we're talking about. Anything that you're, you're, you're doing here, you're learning about this weekend. Okay, so that's the first thing to understand. Because some people will say, well, I need the Roth to self-direct, or I need the traditional. So, no, any account you see on this, as so long as it's held as, as specialized, can be self-directed. You'll also notice that accounts fall into three categories, right? So right above that bold black uh, row, individual retirement accounts, small business retirement plans, also called company sponsored plans, and tax advantage uh, specialty accounts. You are allowed to have one account in each of those categories, and you can contribute to an account in each of those categories. If you're married, multiply that by two. If you've got kids and you've got two kids, multiply that now by four. You see how, so, so very quickly we can start to formulate a custom plan based on where you want to go, okay, to get you there and get you there faster than you think is possible. So uh, you can keep that. Health savings, by the way, health savings account, one of my favorite accounts in the whole world. Absol I mean, we use that actually as a company. We implemented that at our company. Uh, if, you don't, if you're not familiar with health savings account, I mean, I could spend two hours talking about health savings accounts and, and showing you how to implement that. that that's really cool. Uh, so let's see here. I'm just going to skip through some of this. It's not real important to you guys. And let's see here. Oh, yeah. Okay. So, so let's talk about this. this the self-directed process. How many people here actually have a self-directed account of some kind right now already? All right. You, you, so most of you have one. Okay. Let me walk you through, because we're actually recording this too, right? So there's some people who, who are just getting started. I keep forgetting about the video camera. <laughs> so so self-directing is a, is a three-step process. It's what I call my triple D process, okay? Step one is decide, right? What do you decide? When you make the decision that you want to take control of your financial future, that you want to eliminate, reduce, or defer taxes, that you deserve more, that your family deserves more, right? That's the moment you decide that you're gonna self-direct to take control of your financial future. You establish an account, right? Paperwork takes all of 10 to 15 minutes to complete. That's it, you've accomplished step number one. You set up the account, you're ready, you, you got that part done. Step number two, you deposit money in the account. How do you deposit money into a self-directed retirement account? There's three basic ways you can do this, okay? The first one is a contribution. So contributions come from where? Yeah, earned income, right? If you have earned income, you qualify to make a contribution. If you don't have earned income, we can talk about how to create earned income and what that looks like. I was talking to some people today. They, they've done this for family members and everything else. So there's ways that we, we teach on, on how to do this. So contribution is one. If you're raising private money, if you're looking for private money, you're not so much interested in contributions as you are these next two ways of funding a self-directed retirement account. Second way is a transfer. Anybody know where a transfer comes from? Um, yep, you have an IRA someplace else, you transfer all or some of that, right? It's called a partial or a full transfer. If you're working with private money, rollover is a little different, uh, which is the third way. A rollover is a term, it's used a couple different ways in the industry. It's used to refer to, well, who, who knows what where rollover is most commonly used? 401k, right. So you roll it over from an employer plan to a retirement account or an IRA, right? So that's where it's most commonly used. There's something separate called the 60-day rollover, okay? We're not going to get into that unless you want to, but it, you can also do it that way. Hello? Hello? I'll get it. I'll get it. Mike's going to get it, all right. Yeah. Oh, is that the food? Yeah. <laughs> that means it's about time for me to end. Um, so, 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 deposit, so that's the second way. Third way is the rollover. Here's the thing. We always do trustee to trustee transfers. This is very, very important to understand. If you have $100,000 sitting in an old 401k or an IRA someplace else, as long as that movement is done correctly, no tax, no penalty. Every dollar you have over there shows up in your self-directed retirement account. Okay? Very, very important just to know that. The other thing I'll tell you about that is don't ever move money on your own. Ever, ever, ever. Don't do it. 
I can't emphasize that enough. I cannot tell you how many, in fact, Seth and I were just having this conversation about a client the other day. I said, and financial institutions will attempt to do so, always work through our staff if you're moving money or whoever you're getting your IRA with, always, always, always work with them to move the money. I will tell you that I see clients trigger taxes and penalties inadvertently. And I say clients, most of the time it doesn't happen to our clients unless they're doing it on their own and then they call us to try to fix it afterwards. It's not easy to fix. In fact, sometimes you can't fix it. You know, most of the time you can't. That's why I say, do it right the first time. You call us, that's why you pay your fee. You let us handle it for you, okay? So deposit. Third step, so you've got the account set up, you've got money in the account. Third and final step is you direct that money. And that's what makes us a truly self-directed IRA because it's in that step that you tell specialized, you tell your IRA provider, this is what I want to invest my money in, right? This is, and, and that's what happens. And that's effectively the three-step process. What so again, step, the best step? Well, there's a bonus D. Anybody know what it stands for? Distribute. Distribute. That's where you get to spend what you're making. And if we're using Roth accounts, right, you get to do it tax-free, right? Um, let's see here. What else do I have on that? Uh, what about, uh, deal structures, yeah. If you move it from an annuity account to a self-directed IRA account. Ta Tax-sheltered annuity, yeah. So a tax-sheltered annuity can generally move over. Mm -hmm. And what, what I always tell people is, Again, it's real simple. We, one of the things that we do, a service that we provide for clients, we have something we call concierge activation. And so under concierge activation, that's where we take the client, hold them by the hand, we'll get on the phone with them, get on the phone with their current provider, ask all the questions, make sure everything is done correctly to avoid taxes and penalties. With, with tax sheltered annuities specifically, there's something called a surrender charge. Now, it's typically a seven year schedule and it reduces over the period of seven years and it goes down to zero eventually. So one of the things that we do before a client ever moves an annuity is that we get on the phone with the client and the insurance provider and we ask the question, what, if any, fees, penalties, whatever, would be charged to the client? We get that dollar amount to the client so they can say, yes, I want to do this or no, I don't. Some clients know they're going to make enough money. They say, I don't care about a surrender charge. I'm paying it. Some clients say, you know what, I'm going to let it run out. I'm going to wait to move that money. I'm going to move this other money or I'll contribute money, but I'm going to wait for the surrender charge to run out on this and I'll move it later. So are they taxed on that surrender charge? No. no? Oh. It's not taxable. It's, it's a fee paid to the insurance company. Oh. Yeah. Okay. It's a fee paid to the insurance company. Um, deal structures. Let me, let me share with you. There's, there's three deal structures that you can do to grow your accounts. And uh, there, there's... Creative spins and iterations on these three, but there's three core strategies that I always teach that we, see that, that we help clients implement, okay? Now, I'm gonna use real estate for point of illustration because it's an it's a, it's a easier way to make the example, but you can do the exact same thing with notes, okay? It works, whatever the asset is, it doesn't matter, okay? But everybody usually understands real estate, so that's why I use real estate as an example and kind of showing the deal structures. So the first way that um, you can do a deal as what we call an outright purchase. Okay, an outright purchase. So let's use the example of a $100,000 property. You want to buy a property, it's $100,000. You have more than $100,000 in your retirement account, right? In that scenario, it's cash for keys. It's cash for keys. First step in an investment transaction is you have to do what? What do you, the client, or you, the investor, have to do? Find the asset. You got to make an offer to purchase. Whatever it is, right? You got to extend the offer to purchase. Now, if you're going to use your retirement account, what name is going to be on that offer to purchase? Right. Who signs that offer? The custodian on behalf of the owner, or you end up. Is why I'm asking the question because mechanically this is important. You are signing it. You are signing it as agent on behalf of your IRA. Something has to initiate the investment. But typically, from that point forward, we, the IRA provider, will sign every other document. right? Because it's not you purchasing it, it is your retirement account. You're not using your social to acquire or use that for any tax reporting on this investment. You are not using an EIN on a business that you have. Whose EIN are you using? 
You're using your account number, but you're using our EIN. That's what gets you that tax protected status. Okay? So you make that offer to purchase. Agent, on behalf of your IRA, you have your IRA, if that's the type of account you're using, right, on there, you're making that offer to purchase. Then the money goes from your account to so. the, the, the seller. If, it, if it's real estate, it's typically a title agency or a closing attorney, something along those lines, but you direct where those funds are going to go. There's only one place they can't go. Where's that? Your to you personally. It's not going to your own personal bank account. You can't take personal possession of those funds. Key thing. So you're not going to say send it to my bank account or to my LLC's bank account or anything like that. It's going to go directly to fund that investment. Okay, that's what keeps this in compliance. <coughs> now, let's say on that real estate, and again, you think through the different types of investments you're doing, but on real estate, you could have real estate taxes that need paid, right? Where do the real estate taxes get paid from? Yeah. Right. Can you pay them personally? Mm-hmm. What, what do you think? Anybody know what that would be called if you did that? It's, it's called a prohibited transaction, but it's commingling your personal funds with your IRA funds. You cannot commingle. Okay, no commingling. So that's one important distinction. So here's the rule on that. When your IRA owns the, 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 the asset, all expenses right, are paid from the IRA. Now that property, let's say it's a rental property. Where does rental income go? Back to the IRA. Is there any tax due on that income? No. Let's say you sell that rental property for a profit. Where do the profits go? Back to the IRA. To the IRA. What, what taxes do you owe on the profit? None. Right. So think about that. We just went, it's, it's like a 1031 exchange without a time limit. I don't know about you, but I find the best deals when I'm dealing with motivated sellers, not when I'm a motivated buyer. Mm-hmm. That's one of my problems with 1031s, right? Yeah, exactly. I see more bad deals through 1031 exchanges because people are under the gun, right? And that's not, that's not a great way to invest, in my opinion. So that's an outright purchase. Second way. Okay, is what we call an undivided interest or a partnership. Or some people call it a JV, a joint venture. Right? There's different terms used, uh, but an undivided interest is actually how it is held in title. So let me give you an example. Had a client who came to us, very similar scenario. Husband and wife, they wanted to buy a piece of real estate. Husband had about 50000 in his account. Wife had 60000 in her account. Right? He can't buy the asset. He doesn't have enough cash. Right, if we're talking about a $100,000 property. Wife doesn't have enough money in her account either. But here's the cool thing about the self-directed world. Because when you think about this, and you think about all the accounts you have, okay, you can, if you want, you don't have to, but you can think of it as one bucket of money to invest. Because those accounts can partner together. Right? Particularly using something like Jack Shea creates with the trusts. Right? And those kinds of things. That's one way to, to, to connect the dots. So so, they can. They can. So that's what you see here. Husband and wife partners their accounts together to buy that property. Now they have more than enough money to acquire the property. Here's a rule when you, when you do a partnership. Okay? Every partner has to participate in the percentage that you set up on that investment. Okay? So if, they were 50, 50, if, if you have two accounts and there are 50-50 partners in the transaction, half the expenses are paid for one, half the expenses are paid from the other. Same way on the, the split. Now, here's what I'm going to say, because we have a lawyer in the room. So you want to do something fancy, you go talk to the lawyer. But I have clients who will say, well, wait a minute. I'm going to have a dollar come from my Roth and 100000 come from the traditional, but I want 90% of the profits to go to the Roth. And, right? and I say, yeah, no, you're not going to do that. Okay? Now, can we get creative with certain types of investments? Yes, we can. But as a general, that's not going to happen. Now, I've had people say, well, I can have an attorney create different share classes and this, that, and the other thing. Those things might be possible. That's legal advice. That's not something I'm going to share with you. That's what I'm saying. You go talk to an attorney on that. As far as I'm concerned, we're going to keep it black and white, keep it compliant, and that means equal split. Dollar goes in, that dollar gets its share of profits paid back. You had a question. Can non-spouse, non-spouses be partners? Anybody can be partners. I'm just using spouses as an example because oftentimes, again, when we start thinking about legacy strategies, mm-hmm. right? So, so here's the thing, right? So think about Mike. So Mike and his wife have accounts, right? They've got kids. All those accounts could partner together 
Think of it kind of like, not necess- it's not this, but think of it kind of like a family limited partnership, right? You mentioned those last time. So you can think about all the, right? So now what happens is all that money can be funded to, to acquire assets. Now, Mike and his wife are going to be living on that money or using that money prior to the kids. The kids are obviously younger. But who are the beneficiaries on Mike's retirement accounts? The kids, right? Mm-hmm. So ultimately, where do those assets go? Right where they want them to go. Right? So ultimately, we're passing it down. So you see how you can start to orchestrate, if you plan ahead of time, see how you can start to orchestrate this stuff? I mean, this is really powerful stuff. You just have to have a plan for it. So, so partnering is one way that we talk about doing that. You can, you can partner the funds together. That's not the same thing as commingling. You understand there's a dis- the critical distinction. Okay, that's why I say it's about knowing how to put these things together. All right? Yeah, so uh, One quick thing too, you can also partner with your business outside of your IRA. So you put 50% or whatever percentage from your IRA and your regular business account, you can partner those two together. It, it, it's possible to do transactions like that. What I always tell people is, when we're working with clients, is if you can explain to me the end result you're looking for, we can help you mm-hmm. formulate a strategy typically. Mm-hmm. And what I also tell people is just because you can do something doesn't mean you should do it, yeah. okay? I always, I always issue that caution. Um, second way, third and final deal structure. Third and final deal structure. You don't have enough money in the account, your retirement account's allowed to borrow it. Are we, okay, you're good. All right, just, just check in. So if you don't have enough money, your IRA can borrow it. Now, I mentioned to someone, and I'll, and I'll just share this quick story with you, okay, quick case study. Uh, Gary Thomas. Gary Thomas is a client and a friend now in Akron, Ohio. And what happened was Gary's an attorney. Okay, we won't hold that against him. But Gary's an attorney. And at 53 years old, he woke up one day and said, oh my gosh, I haven't invested or saved one dime for retirement. Did not have a retirement account. Okay. So he came to a seminar of mine, and that's where we met, and he opened up a self-directed Roth IRA. He put $4,000, because this was about 11 or 12 years ago, Right? Time flies when you're having fun. It's about 11, 12 years ago. So he, when we established the Roth, he could, it was prior to 06. So he put $4,000 in it that first year. His question to me was, okay, Edwin, I got 4000 in a Roth. What do I do now? So we spent some time mapping this out, but Gary understood what he, the reason why he was doing this in the first place was to create a stream of income that was highly predictable, certain, and secure. That's what he ultimately wanted. So what we did was we created a map to get him there. So what Gary started to do was buy properties in Akron, Ohio. He could buy properties for anywhere from fifteen to thirty thousand dollars a property. He was section eighting out those properties. The reason why he decided to do section eight, because a lot of people hate section eight. And I don't, again, there's there's a million ways to do this, but I'm just telling you specifically what we did with Gary. Reason why we use section eight proper, or tenants was because he knew what the income was going to be before he bought the property, and so he could predict. Okay, here's how much we want to have in it for the kind of return we're looking for. Okay, so he, again, he wanted a lot of predictability in his portfolio. So he decided to go the Section 8 route. However, fifteen to $30,000 is cheap for a property, you think, but he's only got four in the account. So it doesn't matter if it's 30,000 or 100,000, right? It doesn't matter, he doesn't have the money. So what do we do? Okay, what we did was we created a private money program where he went to other people that he knew in the community and said, hey look, you're not getting anything at the bank and the stock market's all over the place. I'll pay you 12%, put you in first position, okay, on this piece of real estate. I'm going to take the rental income to pay off the note. I'll amortize it, fully amortize it over five years and, and you'll have your, your money back. If I default, you take the property. Okay, guess what? All of a sudden, Gary became one of our best lead generators, right, for new accounts because he's referring people in with their retirement accounts to lend to his retirement account, okay? The beginning of 15, first quarter 2015, Gary started to distribute $7,000 a month in tax-free income from his Roths, okay? Every month he gets a pay raise. The reason why he gets a pay raise is that he will not take a distribution from the account on a property until that property is fully paid off. He acquired so many properties from, what was that? If we're going back 11, 12 years ago, that was 04, I think it was when we set up his account. So I think we started this in 04. So 2004, 
He acquired so many properties that every single month he's got a property paying off. So within the next two years, Gary will be distributing to himself, get this, $40,000 a month in tax-free income to himself. This is a guy who decided to hustle and make it happen. He's living a better lifestyle in retirement than he did working as an attorney, right? That's what's possible. That's why I love self-directing so much because that right, th I mean, if you, go to law, if you go to a financial advisor, if he went to a financial advisor, which he probably did, I never actually asked him the question, but if he went to a financial advisor, what is the, what is the advisor going to tell him? It's too late. You can't save enough. You can't do it. Yeah. Right? They, they write us off. They wouldn't even take that little. No. They, they wouldn't even want to deal with it. In fact, if you go to Merrill, if you go to Merrill, I have buddies that work at Merrill still. <coughs> You've got to have 250K to even talk to somebody on the phone. Mm -hmm. They'll hold your money, but they won't let you talk to anybody unless you have at least 250K at Merrill, right? Did, did he manage the properties himself? He set up a, uh, well, what he did was, now he used an LLC inside the IRA because he's got so many properties, he didn't want to have to go through us. I mean, if you're going to have that many prop, I mean, there's legitimate areas where I will tell you it makes sense to have an entity hold assets. This is one of those scenarios because he had so much going on, it would have been a, it, truthfully, it probably would have been a nightmare for him to manage it directly through the IRA with that level of volume. Okay. These were non-recourse loans. These were non-recourse loans. So two things about retirement account, or I'm sorry, borrowing inside the retirement account. Two things you want to know. One is that it has to be a non-recourse loan. Non-recourse loan. Non-recourse loan basically says in the event of default, the lender agrees to take back the property for full satisfaction of the debt. There's no additional recourse back to the IRA or the IRA owner. The reason why that's important is because the rule, one, of the, one of the rules in 4975, which is where prohibited transactions come from, it's Internal Revenue Code, IRC 4975, also 408, so those are the two codes we predominantly look at, um, it basically says that you're not allowed to extend credit to your retirement account, nor anyone who's disqualified to your retirement account can extend credit. You cannot guarantee credit, okay? It doesn't say we can't borrow money, it just says we can't guarantee the money. That's why we need a non-recourse loan. Second thing is, remember what I said earlier from the GAO report, right? When we were talking about the GAO report, I said there's two ways to trigger a tax inside of an IRA. One of them is leveraging or borrowing inside the account. Well, one of the reasons why we, you see different accounts here is because if you borrow money inside your IRA, it's UBIT, it's UDFI tax. We do that same transaction inside of a solo K or 401k, we can eliminate the UDFI. No UDFI on that transaction. So we can eliminate the 990 tax, 990T tax return, we can eliminate uh, the UDFI by using, so that, that's where this consultation comes in handy because if the client says, well, here's what I wanna do, We'll make specific recommendations on accounts, not just based on tax scenarios, but based on asset protection, based on investment structures and deal structures you guys are thinking about doing. All of these are considerations. So you can choose an account. Well, here's what I'll say. You'll never make a bad choice using an account. We go beyond that. We want to help you make an ideal choice in creating your plan. Okay? That's the distinction. You'll never make a bad choice. If you just throw a dart at this chart, you will make a good choice. But, there, but you can do better. Okay, there is an ideal scenario given what you're trying to accomplish. In, in Gary's case, did the gross rents go into the IRA and then the IRA makes the loan payments? No, because remember he was using an LLC. So the rents were going to the LLC and then through the LLC that was owned by the retirement accounts, that's what paid off those notes. Okay. Now what happens, so uh, just a, a, one more thing, you guys probably know this, but I'll mention it just for people who might be new to this. One of the things that Gary, when I say Gary distributes, you know, $7,000 a month to himself, understand the rents come in, he doesn't go take the money from the bank account that the LLC has, that the IRA owns, and takes the money. That would be prohibited. He can't do that. So what he does is the cash goes from the LLC back to the IRA provider. Then he requests a distribution. The distribution is how the money goes to Gary. Understand that process? You never, ever, ever want to take possessional, possession of the IRA money or asset personally. Oh, it always Gary. goes through. So Gary's in his, he, he's probably 63 this year, I think. And he can take those distributions like that? At 59 and a half is when he could start. It's funny because... Um, I thought 70 and a half. No, 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 no 70 and a half is an RMD. Mandatory. That's right. mandatory. Okay. Here's another cool thing about the Roth. So traditional accounts, tax deferred accounts, there's an RMD, required minimum distribution, meaning whether you want to or not, you have to take money out of that account starting at age 70 and a half. 
cool thing about a Roth? No RMDs. So if you don't want to take money out, you don't have to. Okay? Something to consider. There's all kinds of, cons that's why I say estate planning, legacy, all, all these are considerations when we're looking at this, when we're looking at this and we're talking to you, we're thinking through a hundred variables to make a recommendation. Okay? Um, so those are the deal structures. Uh, let's see here. Let's see. I'm going to, I'm going to give you a little perspective here. For those of you thinking about private money, looking for private money to fund deals, here's the opportunity. As of the end of last year, there's $24.7 trillion in retirement accounts right now. That's held by 172 million Americans. We know that because the IRS publishes that data at an aggregate level, okay, because we all file tax returns. And so they know who has IRAs and they know how many retirement accounts are out there. Now, by the way, according to the GAO report that I shared with you earlier, how many of those are truly self-directed accounts? Out of 172 million, how many self-directed retirement accounts do you think there are right now? $8 500,000. 500,000 is what they estimate as of the end of 15. Here's the thing about it. Um, that presents a huge opportunity for you as well as me. That's one reason why we come out and we work with the investment community because we don't do what you do. One of the things we do as an IRA provider, right? We don't provide you the investment. We don't sell you or advise you, right? We don't do any of that. What we do is give you the platform to take control, get all these benefits, and direct it into things that you want, right? And so there's a, there's a tsunami coming because people have been through enough cycles. I will tell you the conversations have changed in my professional lifetime. When the stock market rallied and went up, people stopped moving money to self-directed <coughs> accounts. That's how it used to be 10 years ago. Not anymore. Market rallies, people get even more nervous. They say, you know what? I've recovered some money, I've made some money, I've got to get out before the market takes it back away from me. <coughs> People are desperate for alternatives. You guys represent the alternative, right? Because you can put them in an asset that is more predictable, certain, and secure, okay? That's what they're looking for. They're looking for diversification. They're looking for other opportunities. And that's what you guys uh, present them with that opportunity. So lots of money out there. People are just finding out about it. Um, and if you're raising private money, there's a lot of ways we can help you and your business. Again, you can talk to Seth about that or you know, grab me while we're here. Um, let me just give you one, one, one uh, quick, quick one here. And then, um, actually, do we have time for, do I have five minutes or how much, how, how, yeah, when do yeah, you want to wrap up? We've got, we've got another uh, 45 minutes or something like that, half hour. Oh, before lunch? One, one thing I just wanted to add, do you mind if I jump in? Go ahead, jump in. Okay, so. Um, you guys, I know that everybody's thinking about their own individual IRA accounts. Um, what I find so powerful about this is to really learn about self-directing IRAs, to go out to pitch it to other people that you could potentially borrow from, family members and people that, that's the way I look at this. Like I look at every person in here as a potential company to go out and talk to 15 or 20 people that should open up an account, you know, your, your family, your loved ones, uh, to give them an opportunity to invest with you or, or in the note business, in the real estate business, in whatever it is, by using the tax advantages to give that to these, these family members, this is like an exponential. All right, so there's, there's 15 and 20 people in this room. If, if each one of you talk to 15 or 20 people to open up an account, and whoever you choose, whatever, just to start using this vehicle, that's powerful. And, and I, I know people that have done this and raised millions of dollars for their own investments. And it's not about that guy's $4,000. It's about the people that he helped mm -hmm. come into this structure. So that's the way I, I look at this. Yeah, I'm using about $4 million of, of IRA money right now. Yes. In the, the note investments that we have, you know, I got a dozen or so investors, and so most, most of that is uh, our money. Did you turn them on to the IRA, or they already have them? Some of them were already familiar with the IRA. So, I mean, with the self-directed. Some of them I had to help them get set up as a self-directed. Exactly. Yeah. Was in mutual funds, you know, T. Rowe Price. Mm -hmm. Just to uh, show them the tax on. benefits, and then, yeah. and by the way, well, I'm the investing in notes. You know, it's the improved yield. It's yeah. the higher yield that we can get with self-directed investment. Sure. Sure. Yeah. So, so a couple. Let me let me touch on that. A couple other a couple other quick things on that since Mike brought it up. 
Um, so Gary Thomas, think about him. Like we, you know, I told you the Gary Thomas story, and Gar Gary's kind of the hero of his own story, right? That's what you and I have the opportunity to be. We get to be the hero of our own stories. But you know what? He's the hero of other people's stories too. Because think about all the people that got out of the stock market that are earning 12% in their retirement account based on what he did. That there's a lot. That's one reason. Again, you know, my mom became a social worker because she wanted to do good in this world. I do what I do because I wanted to do good, but I wanted to make a lot of money doing it, yeah. right? right? I didn't want to be a broke social worker my whole life. I did, that was just the choice I made. You and I, Gary, right, we, we have that same opportunity because we can do good and help other people with the biggest challenges they have financially, right? And let me tell you what, it's funny because I'll joke around with, with people at the office, I'll say there's no problem that a self-directed IRA can't solve, mm -hmm. right? Okay, I can show you how I can use self-directed accounts to solve ED. I can show you. <laughs> I can save marriages. Okay, I can do all kinds of things. All right, and, and so I always challenge people. Come up and give me challenges. You try to present a problem to me that I, I guarantee you I will find a way that self-directed can help solve that problem. All right, I believe in it that much. Uh, and, and it comes back to the application. As a side note, the reason why retirement accounts are important to you if you're raising private money or thinking about private money I mentioned the fundraising I did last year. I forgot to bring this up again. So I started the fundraising February 1st, wrapped up June 30th. It was $1.2 million fundraise. Okay. I think there was about eight people that came into that. Half the money was IRA money. Half of it was non-IRA money. Here's why this is important to you. Because, like I said, as investors, we don't care where the money comes from, but here's the reality of it. If you're going out looking for private money, there's 1% of the U.S. population that actually has cash sitting around to invest. That's it, right? It's, it's a very small number. So you're, you're looking for a very small segment of people when you're looking for private money. That's one of the big challenges of private money. But when you know that you can use IRA money, you go from 1% to 67% of the US population because that's the number, that's the percentage of Americans who file returns that have a retirement account. You just changed the landscape. Everybody in this room pretty much raised their hand and said they have a retirement account already. Okay, most people do. The money is all around you. Right? You just have to be aware of the opportunity. Now, here's the simplest, easiest way to raise money from an IRA or from investors. If you, so, so it's this simple. And I'll give this to you because people always say, well, how do, you, how do you bring this up? How do you get them to be aware of this? So, so let me give you the very simple way you do this. It's, it's just a simple change in the language. So when I'm presenting an investment opportunity to somebody, I say you or your retirement account can make this investment with me. You or your 401k, you or your IRA. It's always you or, you and your IRA, right? It's you or and, it's always, I, I never separate the two. I'm always doing that because once you say that three or four times, they say, what, what do you mean my retirement account? Do you have a retirement account? Yes, I do. Well you can self-direct that account into this investment. So if that's the money you like to use, and by the way, you won't pay any taxes on the income that I pay you on it, right? It's that simple. You can introduce it that way. All it is is a change in the language, right? And you're off and running with, with private money. Um, let's see here. 401k, I'll, I'll, I'll call this out here on the 401k. Uh, so again, one of the advantages to a 401k, and we use different accounts for different purposes. I don't get to talk to, about the 401k all the time because you have to qualify for the 401k. One of the, one of the qualifications for a 401k is that you have to have a business, right? You have, to be, you have to have a company that can sponsor the plan. Most Americans don't have a business, so they don't qualify for the 401k, so it doesn't even come up in conversation. But you guys being investors, right, whether you're full-time at it or part-time or you're just getting started, you have the intent to make money, therefore you qualify for the 401k as a general rule. Okay? Now what does the 401k do for you that the IRA doesn't? There's a lot of benefits to the 401k over an IRA. I'm just going to touch on a few. Okay? One of them is you heard me say that the UDFI or the tax, if you're borrowing, goes away. Now I don't get scared about UDFI tax. I don't care about UBIT tax. Gary, by the way, remember I said he used a Roth IRA? He was paying UBIT tax. Not a lot because you get to take depreciation, you have a tax return, right? You take stuff against it. Do you think Gary gives a hoot about UBIT? Gary, if you ask Gary, and I ask Gary, and, I, and every once in a while, in fact, I got to get Gary on a call 
No, I'll do a webinar or something and, 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 and interview him and uh, invite you guys to it. But the, the thing about Gary is he says, I don't give a crap about UBIT. The reason why he doesn't care about UBIT, and see, this is why I'm saying don't, people get hung up on granular stuff and they miss the big picture. That's why I wanted to do this. Gary, if Gary was all hung up on UBIT, Gary would not have $40,000 a month to spend tax-free two years from now. Do you understand that? I don't care about UBIT, not because I want to pay the tax. I don't care about UBIT because I'm not going to let the, 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 the tail wag the dog, if that makes sense. And that, again, when, when people step into the self-directed space, I see too much of that going on. They get hung up on these little details that in the scheme of things, guys, aren't that big a deal, right? Deal with it, whatever. But, we, but UBIT, we, or UDFI, we can eliminate with the 401k plan. Here's another thing that we can do with the 401k plan. I have a client in DC that does this. They drop, between her and her husband in their business, they'll drop about $100,000 in a 401k plan in December. Now they take, do it to take the tax deduction. So they reduce their taxable income. I keep talking about changing that, but this is how they're doing it. They, take, they want the tax deduction because they pay a lot of taxes right now, very high uh, tax bracket, and they make a lot of income. They'll drop 100K in it in December. They turn around and borrow it right back in their business in January. Into what? A 401k? Because the 401k is the one account. You cannot borrow personally from your IRAs, but you can borrow personally from your 401ks. So if you want access to your money today and tomorrow, as well as tomorrow, 401k is a good way to do it. I had a client who literally was getting started in real estate, moved $100,000, which by the way, that's one way to fund it. You can transfer your IRAs into a 401k plan. A lot of people don't think you can do that. It's up, again, it's up to the custodian. A lot, of, a lot of 401k providers will not allow you to move IRA money into the 401k. There's no rule, IRS rule that says you can't do that. Okay? That's a firm rule, like we saw on their IRS website. Firm rules are not the same thing as IRS rules. So sometimes what happens is people say you can't do that and they don't understand the distinction between what's actually in code and what a firm has adopted as a policy. Those are two completely different things. Yeah. Right? They still want there too or this is? This is for your own personal business. Oh. So in other words, we could set up a 401k for your business and if you have IRA money or even at a previous employer 401k money, we could move that in as a way of funding the plan. Oh. So we had a client who, who was getting started in real estate, moves $100,000 over, Right? But here's, here was his challenge he brought. So this is where we get into the scenarios. He says, here's the challenge. I've got all my cash in my retirement account, but I need to make some recurring income right now. Yes, I want to grow my retirement account, but I need to make some income right now. So we looked at the transaction. We looked at what he was trying to do. Long story short, here's what he did. He borrowed half the money, 50000 from the account. Now, by doing the loan, he has tax-free access, penalty-free access. Because what some people do is they get into a financial bind and they take a distribution. You take a distribution, if it's a tax deferred account, right, you pay taxes on the distribution, and if you're under 59 and a half, you pay a 10%, what I call it, early access fee to the IRS, right? They call it a penalty. And so for every 10,000 you take out, you might pay $3,000 to the IRS, okay? So that's an expensive price tag. By doing a loan, no tax, no penalty. So you don't give a dime to the IRS. Secondly, I call it a zero cost to capital. So for people who have credit cards and things of that nature, which is not uncommon, a lot of times people will put money on credit cards to, get, to invest in some training and education to get their business up and running, right? To understand how to do this stuff. Well, here's the cool thing about it. People will take out that loan. You pay an interest rate on that loan, okay? It, the, the, the administrator sets the rate. It has to be what's deemed a fair and market rate of interest. So the way we've defined it is it's prime plus two. So right now, I think it's at five and three quarters. You know, it's like five and three quarters, I think, is the current rate. Mm -hmm. But I call it a zero cost of capital because who are you paying the interest to? Yourself. You're paying right back to your own account. Right. We don't keep it. It's your money, right? So you're just moving money from one pocket to another. That's all you're doing. And so, so it's, it's a zero cost of capital to you. So this client takes the $50,000 that he just borrowed, partners it with the $50,000 in his retirement account, and splits the deal 50-50. Is that pretty cool? Mm. He's making money today as well as tomorrow. So again, these are examples of things that you can do when you understand how to <coughs> really put this together. Yes, sir. Is this, so is this, does that answer the question of uh, being able to access your money to, you know, let's say you're trying to um, quit the rat race and you're using real estate to pay yourself, you'd use that, let's say you, you have $100,000, you'd, you'd use, and you had a self-directed IRA. 
Would you you lend yourself that uh, you lend yourself that hundred thousand dollars in your IRA and pay yourself to, to, to a salary on your IRA? That doesn't fully, the question you asked me, so the question that he asked me earlier at breakfast was, well, I'm getting started investing, I need to make a current income now. But I also get the advantages that retirement accounts offer. So how do I pull this all together? Yeah. This, this, this can be part of the answer, but it's not the whole answer. The, the reality is, because I'm looking at you and I'm saying, you're not close to 59 and a half. So here, here's the reality of it. You're going to do two things. You're going to want to build long-term wealth using some of the stuff I'm sharing with you. You can use other people's retirement accounts to fund deals. That's the way the self-directing can help you. But the way that's going to work is that you, you're going to have a business to generate current income now, right? And so there's, there's, there's other answers to that. And as we keep going, I'll, I'll weave a couple in here for you. But, um, but that's the 401k. Okay, here's another, yeah. The last one you mentioned, that example, like 50,000 from one, 50,000 from I was kind of zoning out. And can you say that again? So he had 50000 personally, right? Because he took out a personal loan. So now that's his money. He can do whatever, no restrictions. When you take out a 401k loan, because it's now in your personal possession, there's zero restrictions on what you do with that money. You can go to Vegas and gamble it. I don't recommend it, but you could. So what's, is there a time frame when you have to pay that whole 50000 back? Yep. So the way the loan works, the way the loan works is that it's a five-year fully amortized note. Okay. So you're paying it back monthly, okay? And... Uh, so the key is when you take the, by the way, here's another advantage. Again, I'll, I'll just layer stuff in. Specialized IRA service is one of the advantages. And we, we, we put it, I mean, you have no idea how much effort we put into stuff for you guys. We're the, and, I'll, and I always qualify this, we're the only provider that I know of, okay? There might be other people out there that do this, but I don't know of them if they do. The problem with a 401k loan is, is that everybody says, just like most, plan, most 401k providers say you can't take IRA money and deposit in a 401k. That's their firm rule, that's not, a, that's not code. So we allow people to do that. The other thing that 401k providers say is that you can only have one loan at a time. That's, that's, that's what they say. So when I hear these things and we, it all kind of becomes conventional wisdom, I'll challenge it. And I'll say, well, we're gonna do the research because is that code or is that a firm policy? Well, guess what it is? It's a policy. It's not a code. And the reason why they have that policy is because it's a headache to, to, to manage multiple loans. But here's the reality of it. It's critically important to you guys to be able to borrow how much you want to borrow. Because if you take out too much, you might risk just blowing the money on something. You increase the monthly payment that you may not want to do. The other thing is, is that if you can only have one loan at a time, and let's say you borrow 30000 you didn't borrow enough. Well, then you've got to pay that back to do another loan before you can do another loan. Mm -hmm. Well, what if you don't have the 30,000 cash anymore? You're out of luck. Now you're stuck, right? You, gotta, you, gotta, you, just, you have a problem. So we worked to create a plan where you can have multiple loans out at the same time. So you don't have to over borrow. You can borrow what you think you need and if you decide you need a different, or a different amount or more money, you can do a second loan. Okay, these are the little things that make a big difference to you. It's all about you having the right options. So can you finish that example on the So, so in that scenario, yeah, so he borrowed the 50,000. He's got 50,000, right, from the 401k, he could do whatever he wants. So what he did was he did a JV where he partnered, not commingled, partnered both funds, sets of funds beside each other so, so on a right, new investment. His personal money and then his 401k right. loan. In that scenario, what mm -hmm. happened was everything, like I said, was split in the percentage that it was set up. In this case, it was pretty much a 50-50 deal. And so what happens is, is that the deal pays off, half the profits go back to the retirement account, the other half he kept the profits and paid, paid off the note, right? And then he <coughs> could do that transaction again. That's why I say it's like having a, a zero cost of capital or a, a credit line, a personal credit line or a credit line for your business, zero, you know what I mean? That's pretty advantageous. The other thing is five, five and three quarters percent is way better than CD rates. So even if you just took out a loan and paid it back, right? I mean, it's like, if, if you're not doing even anything else with your money, I mean, you can, you can at least get more money. It's another way, kind of, interestingly enough, that you can put more money in the account. Rate, that the rate you have to pay it back That's the rate we charge. Like I said, the administrator sets the rate, and it has to be equal across all plans. So that applies equally to everybody. Related to that is, if I'm buying a pool of loans, I suppose it's $200,000, and I got 100000 in my IRA account, and 100000 in my business account, that's not a prohibited transaction, right? I can, I can buy that pool of loans as long as I make out two separate purchase contracts, one, one purchase contract to my IRA, and one purchase contract to my business? Right, I'd say it's possible to do that deal, right? You're, you're separating out the assets. 
you don't own them. It's a new purchase, a new investment. Right, it's coming from a third right. party. So, yeah, so, right. it, I mean, that happens all the time. Clients, you know, clients will do stuff outside their retirement account, they'll do stuff inside their retirement account. But I can, but I can do, a sign with, like, I can, on the same month, I can trade, do a trade where I'm buying part of that fund of loans from, with my IRA money and part of that fund of loans with my personal money. As long as you don't own it yet, no, correct, yeah. No, it's, a, it's, you know, if Mike Rasek is selling me a pool of loans. Oh, yeah, yeah. <clears throat> Check. Uh, a lot of deals with uh, uh, borrow with UBIT will make you more money than without you. If you pay, when you pay the tax, yeah. you're making 12 or 14 percent. You pay the tax and you'll make more money with, you, with uh, other people's money than off this zero. Yeah. And you know the other the other thing too that I'll say about that is that again when I say don't let the tag don't let the tag don't let the tail wag the dog. I, Mike fed me too much fireball last night, guys. Sorry. <laughs> uh, but <laughs> it's still kicking in. I still feel it. Um, but here's the thing. You know, like I said, Gary would have never had the opportunity to create what he created without it. Now you'd say, well, if if you can avoid the U bit using a 401k plan, why didn't you use your 401k plan instead of the Roth IRA? Because the Roth 401k didn't exist in 04. But when they instituted that in 06, we actually switched to the 401k, Roth 401k. So he has some deals in the Roth IRA, but most of them actually are in his Roth 401k. So again, these are things that, here's another point. As you go through your life and your family situation changes, your financial situation changes, we can evolve this with you, right? It's, what, where you're at today could be very different than where you're at five years from now. And you may want to be making some changes and alterations to that. So can you talk a little bit about um, the limits? Like if I make $200,000 a year, I know, I think you've got it down here. Is that the MAGI, is the maximum AGI? AGI? Modified adjusted. The, modified the, adjusted. The MAGI applies, so, so MAGI, your modified adjusted gross income, last line on the front page of your 1040. Uh, that is used to figure out what you're allowed to deduct, what you're allowed to contribute, right? That's kind of the, the, the equalizer that the government uses to figure out how to apply all this financial information you see on this page, all right? So in terms of what to contribute, now the way it applies here at the bottom, because you're looking at the Roth IRA column, that applies to whether or not you qualify to contribute directly to a Roth. Right, and my, right? my accountant will tell me, Gerald, you make too much money this year, sorry you can't contribute to your IRA, you know. Yeah, and, and the problem with that statement is that he's correct and incorrect all at the same time. And the reason why I say he's correct is you're right, you can't contribute it because that's what the paper, I mean the paper says that, you can't contribute it. However, what I can do, right, and this is why, this is, this is such a useful tool, uh, so if you look here at funding, so traditional funding, contribution transfer rollovers, you'll see there's no income limits on contributions here. There are income limits on the Roth, but look here where it says funding, contributions, transfers, rollovers. Under Roth, contributions, transfers, rollovers, and there's a fourth one, conversions. So what that means is if you can't, if you make too much to go directly to the Roth, we have you contribute to the traditional we then convert it to the Roth because there's no income limit on conversion. See that? So, so the, the traditional limits, there's no limits on traditional? No. The, the way that that applies is whether or not you get to take the deduction. So, here, so, so there's, a, there's a complicated chart that says are you married, are you single, are you covered by a company sponsored plan, are you not covered, what's your income? Here, and, and then you figure out if you're able to take the deduction. Okay, I spent a lot of time studying that chart and I can summarize it for you. Okay. If you make any kind of real money, you don't qualify to take a deduction. That's basically the answer. But you can still contribute. So in that scenario, you put the money in the Roth, we just move it right to the Roth anyway, because you're not, you're not even getting the front end be benefit. But most people we're doing this for, again, in fact, it's interesting because we just went through tax time and I had a guy like literally the day before tax time, frantic, he's, he's emailing me and his CPA because the CPA said, you're not eligible to do this. And I'm like, yeah, he is. Uh, so I had to give her the code. I had to show her in, in, in uh, publication 590. I had to get her publication 590 to show her where, yeah, actually, this is completely permissible. And then she was okay with it. But, but that's the problem. Like a lot of people, they don't, they don't specialize in this stuff, so they just don't, they just don't know. So but you can take it when you can take, um, contribute to a traditional IRA, you're over the income limits. You're over 55, I'm talking theoretically here. Mm -hmm. 
not a theoretical person. <laughs> and and for successive years, do that and do a conversion to a Roth tax-free subsequent. It's tax-free if you didn't take a deduction on the front end. Correct. Right, because you've already paid, it's already after tax money. Right. Mm -hmm. if, okay. if you got the deduction, then it would be taxable at the time of conversion. So right. you would have specialized do the trustee to trustee, custodian to custodian transfer. Yeah, we, we, in fact, this is the thing. The, we have all the paperwork, like we do it simultaneously if the client wants to. So we set up the traditional, we call it a conduit account, we set up the Roth, we transfer the money to the traditional, or if you're contributing, you write the check, right? you deposit in your traditional, there's a conversion form, it says basically take the money from the traditional, move it to my Roth, it's, it's just a matter of paperwork, it's super simple and we just do it simultaneously, it's all instantaneous for the most part. But it's 100% compliant and legal, and that's the key. One last right? question on a different issue, and Jack might be able to explain this better than me, is I know one of the things that a lot of my friends do with IRA accounts is wrap a loan. So they might have $2,000 in an IRA, and someone needs a $100,000 loan. So they'll contribute $2,000 into their IRA, at, from their IRA, at like a, uh, an 8% interest rate, and the, and the 98000 is coming from his account at a, a 5 or 6% interest rate, and you, your IRA, it just blows up your IRA. Oh, yeah. It's, uh, wraps, I love wraps inside of a Roth. I mean, it's a great way to, to, your, to just explode it. Oh, yeah. It's huge. Money. You could get a 100% return in some cases. It, oh, yeah. It's, it's, it's incredible. I mean, and there's all kinds of things like that you can do. I mean, I mean that's why I say the key is just you, you get going and you get a plan. And what's right? really beneficial is when you got, you know, 4000 bucks in your IRA. Yeah. yeah. And, you, and you can get 80% ROI on that $4,000, you know. Yep. And then you could turn around and do the same thing for your buddy, you know, right? Mm -hmm. You know, you can scratch each other's back. You know. Can you uh, wow. can you explain under the solo 401k and safe harbor 401k? I'm looking at um, I guess these are the contributions you can give. Right. Says, uh, under the solo 401k, it says 18,000. I'm taking out the individual under 50. Right. But then it says the employer can donate 32,500. dollars Right. So does that mean me as an employer of my actual company, I can give um, contribute eighteen thousand, and the actual company can contribute that other thirty-two? Correct. So the way the way contribution limits work, and this is across the board. There's two things you got to look at. This is how the government defines contribution limits. They use two ways to define it. One is a percentage of income. One is a dollar amount. Mm -hmm. So with the IRA contributions. And it says, you know, 5,500 if you're under 50, which I don't think anybody in here is over 50, so I'm just going to stick with the 5,500. Right? So, so 5,500. So, so. <laughs> so, you you have a so it says 5,500 dollars is the maximum or aggregate dollar amount not to exceed 100% of your earned income. 100, so in other words, if you pay yourself 3,000 this year, your contribution limit to an IRA is 3,000. If you pay yourself 10,000 this year, it's 5,500. That's how those two numbers play together, okay? Now, when you look at the 401k, to come to your question, there's two ways to make that contribution, as an employee and as an employer. You see the dollar amounts, those are the max dollar amounts, but the percentages are different. So as an employee, you can go up to 100% of your compensate or your earned income okay not to exceed 18 or 24 depending upon age and then as the employer you get to make a an employer contribution to the plan up to the dollar amount you saw there but not to exceed 25 percent of your compensation so if you pay yourself a hundred thousand this year you could put 18 in as of the employee 25,000 25 percent times a hundred right 25,000 as the employer. So it's 25 plus 18 would be your max contribution in that scenario. Cool thing about that, the 18 can be Roth if you want it to be. The 25,000, the rule says that it has to be in the tax deductible portion of the plan. But in 2013, this isn't something that most people are not aware of, they changed the rule and they allow for in-service conversions. So literally, the moment that twenty-five thousand hits that account, we can convert it to the Roth if you want. 
Okay, so that can be all Roth money if you choose. Like I said, if you're married, you can multiply those numbers times two. Hire your spouse in the business, split the compensation, how you guys are paying yourselves out, and you can put more money in these plans. By the way, you can fully maximize your contribution to that Roth 401k and also to the Roth IRA. So again, and again, you got a spouse, multiply that by two. That's why I say you can have an account and contribute in each category. So that's how with, with my high income earners, right, we start to very quickly funnel a lot of money into these accounts. Okay. One, one other, so a couple quick things on the, on the 401k and then we'll, we'll get off the 401k. Just, but I, I, it's, it's important enough to you. By the way, is this good information for you guys? So the thing is with the 401k, again, I like to point these things out so you guys are armed with enough information that you know. Because one of the big challenges people have with self-directing, they say, you know what, I'm really interested, but I don't even know what questions to ask. So my goal here is not to give you all the answers because I already told you we have an avenue where we'll spend time with you talking one-on-one -on -one and help you out. It's just that I want you to have enough information that you can even feel like, hey, now I know what to ask. Now I know how to start thinking about some of these things and put this together. So the 401k, another benefit, as we were just talking about, is a higher contribution limit, right? So you can put more money in a Roth 401k than you can in a Roth IRA. So that's another benefit. UDFI goes away. You have access to the money. You can borrow it personally. Asset protection, another big, big, big thing, okay? So with IRAs, what I tell people generally is not always true. Generally, I, retirement accounts are asset protected or judgment proof in all 50 states. On the IRA side, though, you actually have to look at the individual state and see how they apply the statutes. Now, the statutes can vary from Roth to traditional even. So you have to look at that. Here's the other problem with state. I had this come up, a client, um, well, she's a new client, and she <laughs> had a traditional IRA, and her ex-husband, uh, what was it an ex-husband? I can't remember the scenario. It was not an ex-husband, because I'm going to tell you there's a couple exceptions to this. But there was, there was some judgment that had gone against her, and the judge said, take it out of the IRA and give, pay, pay the judgment. Okay? Now, my understanding with Florida was they can't do that. So I literally looked up the statute for her where it said the traditionals were protected. And I gave her that statute and I said, go take it to an attorney, right? I said, because I, I'm not an attorney, I can't help you, but you, you need to go find an attorney to help you with this. So I, got her the, so I got the Florida statute, I got the language, I gave it to her to take to the attorney. Here's the point. The judge, in my opinion, was wrong in that scenario. However, the judge did it. But with a 401k plan, because they're governed under a different set of rules, the 401ks are judgment proof in all 50 states because they're protected at the federal level. I don't think, regardless, so I don't think the judge would have ever been able to do that. I, don't, I think the judge is aware enough that they would not have been, and by the way, the 401k provider probably would have said, hell no, mm -hmm. we're not sending this out without the client sign off because this is a violation. Like, we can't do this, okay? So, so here's the key with, with the asset protection on those qualified plans. These plans are judgment-proof. The, they're protected at the federal level, okay? Now, there's two exceptions to the rules, okay? One is the IRS, because let's face it, they can do whatever they want. And the second one is the event of divorce, right? The court will issue a quadro, is what it's called, and it will split the ass, it will split the accounts and, and the assets that you have if, if you dissolve a marriage or you divorce. But outside of those two exceptions, the 401ks are judgment proof in all 50 states. Now let me just tell you that how solid that is and how important that is to you. Because if you have a business that goes bankrupt, or you personally file bankruptcy, if you had 10 properties in there as an example, spending off cash flow, you realize they can't touch those. You have income coming in for the rest of your life. It doesn't matter what happens to you personally, they can't pierce that, okay? You can be tried and convicted of a criminal offense and the court can take your life, but they can't take your 401k, mm -hmm. okay? Doesn't seem right, but that's how it works. <laughs> and so, and, and by the way, there's, there is a test case for that. Really? O.J. Simpson. Simpson. He was, he was found not guilty in criminal court, but he was found guilty in civil court and had a $20 million judgment. They were not able to collect anything for years because he was living off of his pension, which follows uh, under the qualified plan rules. They couldn't pierce it. The only time the Goldmans got any money was when they seized some of his memorabilia and merchandise, if you remember that in the news, right? 
but what but he did very well i mean i had friends who in fact this weekend right they go to the kentucky derby every year he was there right yeah. and uh he was living the same lifestyle he always did because they couldn't pierce that plan that qualified plan that's how rock solid right these plans are so asset protection if you're concerned about that big big deal right so so consider the 401k plan as an option or an alternative to the ira as well uh let's see here Edwin, uh, yeah if, if, if you have if you're self-employed and have employees a couple employees from the 401k viewpoint you must make contributions on behalf of the employee. right that's why you see two on there so the solo k applies to you and or you and a spouse that's it you have any employees now contractors don't count right. but employees do count you are under safe harbor now that is a critical distinction okay so you can contribute up to thirty-five thousand for yourself and a percentage of the employees income. that's where it gets tricky on, on the match side whatever you do for yourself as a general rule you're going to do for your employees now we can create custom plans we can work with our administrator to create custom plans uh, to get that done um, but as a general rule you know you're going you're going to make a matching contribution whatever the match is you do for yourself you're going to do for employees so it's you know it's just a cost of doing business we we're, we we are implementing the the 401k for our employees this year right. we're putting that in place because there are exclusions you can have right first two years right. uh, somebody's on board with you you can exclude right. things like that um, two, two. two um and you can put provisions in there that that exclude people we 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 are ones where you know again it's our philosophy you know we started a business to improve the world and, and specifically our community so at, at 20 hours we make all our employees eligible for benefits so we have people who work part-time and they get health insurance from us you know what i mean but that's something we choose to do as an employer everybody has their right to make a choice most of our clients don't want to do things like that and they they want to minimize the cost in many cases just they need to right small businesses are hard to make work and there's only so much money to go around so they'll minimize the cost but just know as a general rule if you put five percent in for yourself you're putting five percent in for every employee so this is not a match situation it's a contribution for the employee it's a contribution right safe harbor is a contract it's a safe yeah so so it's it's a yeah and there's different types of ways to make the contribution it depends how we draw up the plan sure. but just just know generally if you have employees whatever you contribute for yourself you're you're contributing to them on the employer side by the way the nice advantage of the 401k each plan on here is different we have SEP simples okay is that with the 401k it's for participating employees so if you have two employees and neither one of them participate in the plan you're not making any matching contributions for them you could max out your you, you could put the 25 percent in this year and then if they participate next year you might drop it to five right so you can make those adjustments a um, couple legacy strategies and then we'll take questions or wrap up or what however you want to handle mike uh, so so i said legacy is real important let me give you a couple of 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 seeds here to take with you um, in terms of creating a, a legacy so here's the deal there's one thing you have to have to set up a Roth IRA and contribute to it what is it earn income right earn income so if your child if you have kids or grandkids somebody you care about that you want to start thinking about this for if they work at McDonald's right or they have a job do they have earned income yes. so they qualify to make a contribution right if your kids don't have a job can you pay them to work in your business can they mow lawns on properties can they help you with paperwork or something along those lines right because they have earned income now i know what some people say they say but edwin you don't understand my kids are completely useless and i can't get them to do nothing okay <laughs> that's okay i have a strategy for useless kids too because i have a few of my own and this is it right our dad buys houses now here's here's how i use the kids because you see the kids in my presentation right now you saw them at the beginning of the presentation you think I'm just putting them there because they're cute smiling faces advertising. it's it's advertising it's marketing and my kids get real excited when you know I come home because they say dad we're so excited to see you now pay us <laughs> and the reason why I have to pay them is because they believe they're under the the impression that they're professional models <laughs> right and I have to pay them for the use of and like the use and likeness of their image in, uh, in my presentations right <laughs> but now they have earned income so now they can have a Roth IRA right and and so that's the key the key is earned income you can create 
earned income. By the way, under age 18, they're not paying social security tax. So it's, a, it's another cool thing to do. Now, why would I want to do this? This is where it gets really interesting. I want you to think about this. Einstein observed, he says, the most powerful force on earth is compound interest. Okay? Now, Einstein was a pretty smart guy. He was so smart, he got it half right. Okay? I'll show you why he got it half right. Here's the scenario. You, you open up a Roth starting at age one for someone that you care about, right? Grandchild, child. You make a one-time contribution of 5,000. So we looked at 5,000 over contributing that over 30 years. We're not talking about that anymore, right? We're talking about 5,000 how many times? One time. You get 10% on the money, which we've already discussed that we can do in this room, right? 10% on the money or better. At age 65, because we're going to use the number that Social Security used in their report, at age 65, how much do you think your child, your grandchild, would be worth? 3.237. It depends if you're using arithmetic or, or, it depends on the type of calculation you use. Mine is a little less than yours. About two and a half million dollars. Seven, eight, seven or eighty months. Well, it depends if you're. Uh, it's timing of deposits and interest and those kinds of things. So you'll get some variation. Here's the thing, because I have people like him in the room who do the math, <laughs> I use the conservative calculation. Because if I said three and you came up with two, you're going to say yeah. I'm sliding the deck. Yeah. So we all have calculators. We all. Everybody has calculators. Regardless of a lot. The point is, it's a lot. Thank you. <laughs> so. So here, it's a good number, two and a half million dollars. Now think about that for a second. Because remember what we talked about before. We don't care about a lump sum. We can't draw down on the nest egg. What we need to do is spend the income. So if your child, so we were making 10% on the money, 10% times two and a half million dollars is how much? $250,000 basically a year. From a Roth, 0% taxes. Think about that for a second. Two, two, you know, for five grand one time. I mean, you can, I mean, would you not be in a better, would you not be thrilled if your parents or grandparents did that for you right now today? I mean, think about how different your life would look. For a one time five, five this is why I'm saying, like, everybody can afford to do these kinds of things. This is not rocket science. It's just people don't, under, they just don't have the perspective. My you just make it a priority. Kids are a lot of money for doing the work here this <laughs> Yes, I have to make some contributions. <laughs> So now here's why Einstein got it half right. Because let's face it, most people aren't sitting in this room. Most people, right, don't know how to get 10%. Most people aren't, don't know the difference between a Roth and a traditional. And if they're talking to their tax advisor, they're probably saying, go with the traditional. If they're saying anything at all, and they're probably not even using a retirement account. So if you throw the retirement account out the window, how much over that period of time would the IRS and various other taxing authorities, state, local, municipalities, take from your child, how much would your child be left with at age 65? What do you think? 300,000. You ready? You're real close. Government takes about 1.9 million in taxes over that period of time. Your child is left with 550,000. Now this is why I said earlier, if you don't, ha you understand the difference between Bill Gates and J.P. Morgan now? This is Bill Gates' scenario. You know, this, this is the J.P. Morgan scenario. Which one would you rather be? Now, they're both rich, so you say you don't care, except the reality is, is that there's a big difference between that number and that number. Yeah. Huge, right? It's all the difference in the world. You can't create sustainable wealth for yourself and future generations if you don't manage the taxes. It's just too crippling to do it. You just can't work that hard. You can't outspend what the government has taken from us. Okay? I so Rockefeller was worth a little shy of a trillion dollars. Yeah, you know what? Yeah, the, the, truthfully, probably the richest person I, that comes to my mind hasn't been verified, but I think Pablo Escobar. Mm -hmm. <laughs> right? right? But think of it, he paid no taxes. Yeah. 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 I mean, he paid no taxes. I mean, when you can make a lot of money, you don't pay any taxes, you can accumulate a lot of wealth. Well, what, you know? I mean, it was, it was obscene what he was making. But that's the point. Taxes, you know. I mean, he, he offered to pay off Colombia's national debt. <laughs> I mean, how many people can afford to pay off a country's national debt if they'll just let him be, you know? You know, just, yeah. I mean, that's a big price tag to get out of trouble. He um, does have a high security So So that's, that's the difference between... So, here, so a couple takeaways there. Just 
again, fundamental big picture stuff, guys. Here's the reality of it. A Roth allows you to go from forever taxed to never taxed. It's the only way I know to do it. I have friends who have become expatriates, renounced their US citizenship, spent half a million dollars to go through that process, and it's a very painful emotional experience, and it all has to do with taxes. The reality is, you don't need to go to that level of effort, okay? There's simpler ways to do these things. Go from forever tax to never tax. That's what a Roth affords you. That's what it affords your kids. Okay? That's what it'll do for your family. And uh, the second takeaway is no matter what, you've got to do something. Like I said, you'll never make a bad choice, but make the right decisions on the front end. This is what I'll close with. I'll give you this, and this will come back to your question about how do I manage money today, right, and make money today, earn, earned income, as well as the future. So like I said, there's different answers to that. Here's what we have. Across the top, we have real life. That's my life. Across the bottom, we have an actuarial table. Got that from my friends at the insurance company. Now, I'm going to do better than what the actuaries say. I think you're going to do better than what the actuaries say, but we're just going to use for points of this illustration the numbers that they come up with. Okay? What they say is that at age 35, right, I can establish a Roth, open, contribute, invest, grow, spend over my lifetime, which they say I'm going to live to be age 70. Right? Now, what happens when I pass away with that Roth? Well, here's the cool thing about your retirement accounts. They're effectively trusts, which you're going to hear all about tomorrow, right, from Jack. So IRAs are effectively trusts. What that means to you is that they bypass probate. They go directly to your beneficiaries. So think about Gary Thomas for an example, because here's, here's the real life scenario. 95% of people, right, don't have enough in retirement. They don't have financial security. That's why they're working at Walmart. When one spouse passes away, which typically who goes first? Husband. Husband. Why is that? We're not going to answer that question because we're going to get different answers from the guys and the girls. So, but the point is, is that the wives outlive the, live the husbands, statistically speaking. That's what happens. Who has a harder time in retirement today, men or women? <clears throat> women. Why? Because they live longer. It just requires more money. So what the most common scenario is, truthfully, right now in our society, is that dad passes away, mom relies on the kids. Okay? Kids don't want to have to take care of an older relative. It is harder taking care of an older relative than it is raising kids. And if you've never taken care of an older relative, you don't know what I mean. I hope you don't find out. But let me tell you what, it's way harder than raising kids. The, the kids don't want that. And guess what? Mom doesn't want that either. Mom hates the fact that she is reliant on the children. Nobody wants to be in that scenario. So again, this is where self-directing can solve the big challenges of life. Because what happens is you take Gary Thomas, who's spending off $40,000 a month from his Roth, three years from, two years from now. He passes away. That Roth goes immediately to Mrs. Gary Thomas. We get the death certificate in the office. We retitle the account. With an inherited account, you have two choices. You can take it as your own, which I would recommend, or you take it as an inherited account, right? She, what that means is the very next month after we get that death certificate, we retitle the account, guess what happens? The checks get cut to her and no longer to Gary. His wife never has to worry about relying on the kids, right? My wife, you can see there's a vacancy there right now, but my spouse would never have to worry about relying on the children. And the children don't have to worry about taking care of mom because I've already seen to that. Now, what happens, again, actually speaking, right, they say that my spouse is going to outlive me by 10 years. So she passes away. Then what happens to that account? Goes it goes to those four hoodlums right there. <laughs> right? And here's the really cool thing about inherited or beneficiary Roth IRAs. When you inherit an account, you know, I told you earlier, right, 59 and a half is the age where we can start to take qualified distributions, as they're called. Well, that's true, except in an inherited situation. Because when you inherit an account, okay, there's, the age restriction goes away. No age limit. Right. They will spend that money tax-free the day they inherit the account for the rest of their life, which the actuary says is going to be about 55 years. Think about that. You want to rewrite your family legacy, this is how you do it. Think about, think about Gary endowing his children with $40,000 a month in tax-free income for the rest of their lives. Is that pretty incredible? Okay. 
This is not complicated stuff, but this is how it comes together. Now, I'll plant another seed, going back to your question. I just told you that there's no age limit when you inherit a Roth IRA. So, do you have any older relatives? You might, would you want to open up a Roth for an older relative? You see where we're going with that? So if you have grandparents or parents, you can open up an account for them. You help them, right, invest it, grow it, and you're the beneficiary on that account. You see that? When that comes to you, you can spend the money tax-free the day you inherit the account. So that's another way to apply this. You see this? So I help clients do this all the time. Um, in fact, we, just so you know, one, one trick, one thing to keep in mind on this strategy. And, I, and we, we, again, I mean, I, I've done five-day workshops on this stuff, right? I mean, you can probably tell. I mean, we're just, we're just scratching the surface right now. I mean, because that's what we have time to do. But I have a client. He's a very successful investor. His name is Mark. And his wife has two siblings. He decided he was going to help his father-in-law by investing the account. It's got a small account, about $90,000, right? Not huge, traditional IRA. And he said, so he calls me and we're talking about this. He says, look, I want to help Dina's dad out. I'm going to help make, make him some more money. If he gets another $1,000 to $2,000 a month, that's a big deal for him because he's living on Social Security, basically, right? a little bit of savings. He says, oh, I'm going to help him out. But here's the thing. He said, um, you know, I'm going to explode that account to like half a million dollars or more probably by the time he passes away. And he says, you know, I don't want any of that money going to Dina's relatives uh, or her, her siblings, right? Because I'm the one doing the investing. Mm -hmm. He said, uh, he says, so what do you think? And I said, well, I, I think that she's going to end up not talking to her brothers and sister anymore when that happens because that's real life. Mm -hmm. you, you're going to tell them that they don't get half a million dollars, it's dad's main asset? That's not going to work very well. He says, so what do you suggest we do? I said, well, don't worry. Here's what we're going to do. We're going to move the money over to the self-directed account, but we're going to set up three traditionals, not one. Why three? Because there's each one has its own beneficiary. Exactly right. Now, here's the other thing. You cannot convert an account when you inherit it. So you inherit a traditional, can't be converted after death to a Roth. It's got to be done beforehand. So Mark wants the account to be a Roth because they don't want to spend money, they don't want to pay taxes. But he didn't want to pay the tax bill for the entire account since he's not getting the money. Does this make sense? So we split the account into three traditionals. Then the one that Dean is the beneficiary on, we convert that one to a Roth. See that? That's pretty slick, ain't it? Now, each account has its own beneficiary. So when dad passes, guess what? No fighting, problem solved, everybody gets their own IRA. The big cash deals Mark is going to do, he's doing in the Roth that Dina is the beneficiary on. You see that? Right. We've eliminated all the issues up front. Wow. So there's all kinds of ways that we can use these strategies, yeah. right? I mean, this is the kind of stuff we engineer for clients. I mean, this is what I'm saying. So, so think about who you're working with. But, but these are the kinds of things that you guys can set up. I mean, is this pretty cool stuff? I mean, I mean this is life changing. I mean, that's really what we're talking about. We're talking about changing your financial life, not just you but your family. Now let me give you one, one more on the beneficiary designation because this is one that, again, it took me a little while to figure out. But what happens is, is that you have two types of beneficiaries on, a, on an IRA. You have primary and contingent. Primary means, right, so my spouse is the primary, when I have a spouse, will be the primary beneficiary on my retirement account. That means it goes to her. Okay, the kids are the contingent. That's kind of the scenario. Mm -hmm. What happens though is that clients, as they get older, say, well, wait a minute, because you can only pass it one generation. You can pass it anywhere you want, but you can only pass it one time. So once the kids start having grandkids, they're like, well, what do I do? So here's what we do. We name the kids as primary. We, change, we update the beneficiary designations. We name the kids as primary. We name the grandkids as contingent. The reason why we do that is because at the point of death and that account passes, the primary can decline to take it. So the primary can decline to take it, in which case it will pass to the contingent beneficiaries. 
the benefit of that is that you extend it out for a longer period of time because we're talking about life expectancy, right? That's how these distributions work. So the idea is that you want to create these things to be set up as long as you can. So what we'll do is we'll set it up to where the kid is the primary, grandkids are contingent. That way, when mom or dad passes, the child can make the determination. It doesn't make sense for me to take it, or are we going to open it in, 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 in the grandkid's name and extend that life out longer, right? So all kinds of cool estate planning things that we can do here. Can I all right, go ahead. And if you leave it to children or grandchildren, you can set up a specialized kind of trust called an IRA inheritance trust because the U.S. Supreme Court determined three years ago that an inherited IRA doesn't get the asset protection that the participant has. And we were talking about mm -hmm. the, uh, the, each state provides asset protection up to a certain amount for IRAs and federally your, your uh, asset protection on 401 case. But what you can do is you can name a specialized trust as a beneficiary with each kid having an account, and this specialized trust will enable the trustee, if there's a risk of a creditor or a creditor, a divorcing spouse, of that child or grandchild coming in, they can toggle off the switch so it becomes what's called an accumulation trust until the risk passes, and then turn the switch back on so asset can be distributed. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So you can protect generationally, and has to protect the, the, the Roth, the children and grandchildren. Yep. Can it be for like a niece or nephew? It can be for anybody you want. It, I, I say kids and grandkids because most commonly that's where clients are using it. But there are situations where people don't have kids, but they have a niece or a nephew, or they have somebody who's, who's very you know, dear to them. You, you, you can do it for anyone. Right. You know. <laughs> yeah, so, all right, so, so, so that's some of the, so again, you guys get in the bigger picture here. So, so again, we can get real granular, and that's fine, but again, I want, I want to give you another perspective here. I want you to think about really what's possible for you and your family, because you can do all kinds of things, right, that you probably haven't even dreamed of yet. So let's see here. Uh, all right, so that's it. I'm going to end there. Awesome. And uh, are we ready for lunch, or are we going to... Do a couple of questions. If you guys got questions. Questions answered. But, go ahead. How many people work for our company? So that's a good question. In fact, you know what? I'll, I'll parlay that in because somebody, somebody asked me the question earlier about how money is protected in a self-directed account. Who was who it that was asking me when we were at we're breakfast? Yeah, we were talking about that. Okay, so you asked about it. So here's one of the questions that comes up. And, and I'm going to reframe this question a little bit. Gerald asked the question and he said, you know, there's a 1031 exchange company who absconded with somebody's money, right? And he said, so how do I know, like how do we know how our money is protected? And, and, and I said, you know, the funny thing about that is, this is what I told Gerald, I said, you know, people will kind of dance around that question sometimes. And I say, well, here's, I, and I don't know how 1031 companies work, so I can't, when I say I don't know how they work, I don't know how they're legally structured, so I can't speak to directly to that. But I'll reframe the question, I'll say, here's the question you're, you're basically asking. How do you know I'm not or we're not Bernie Madoff? Right? That's really what you want to know, right? That's, that's the answer you want. You have checkbook control over our money. <laughs> yeah, there you go. I got checkbook control over your money. Uh, so you got the we don't know you. We don't know you. We don't know your morals. We don't know your 100%. Business. We don't know your financial condition personally. Exactly. So. There's all these unknowns. So, so this is, the, and so that's why I say this is a, such a great, great question. So I'm going to, so let me talk about what happened with Madoff. And then we're going to talk about contract by contrast how self-directed IRA custodians and have to operate. With Madoff, the way he was able to do what he did was that he was basically an unregistered hedge fund. So when I was in on that world, right, you have two types of investments. You have registered or unregistered. Unregistered basically means you don't have to deal with the SEC like you do when you have a registered investment, right? They're not up your yin-yang, so to speak. Well, that's what allowed Madoff to operate the way he did because he wasn't having to publish reports, he wasn't being audited or examined by the SEC or FINRA or any of these uh, enforcement agencies, effectively. So basically, he blew his own whistle, right? I mean, he, 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 he effectively told on himself because it just kept going on and on and on. By contrast, how does a self-directed IRA custodian or provider work? So here's what happens. To become a, a, a custodian, okay, the first thing is you have to apply, so, so 
licenses are handed out on a state by state basis. You get licensed in a state and it allows you to be do business in all 50 states. You get licensed at a firm level. When I was in the advisory world, we were licensed at an individual level. In this world, in the trust world, we're licensed at a, a company level or corporate level. So what happens is you, you apply, you have to pass background checks and everything else administered by the state. Then you have to meet a capital requirement. Okay? So the capital requirement basically means I have to put half a million dollars in an account and I can't touch it. And it's there for the benefit of the client. Right? So in other words, if the government say, or the state says, oh my gosh, you've done something wrong, or we think you've done something wrong, they get to go take that money. So first thing is you've got to be able to sit on half a million in cash and do nothing with it, right? which limits the playing field, which is one reason why you have very few companies in our space. So there's, there's that. Then the state says you have to have the money basically in government insured or government guaranteed assets, i.e. FDIC. So all client cash is held in an omnibus account that's FDIC. It's a pass-through account where all cash is insured by the FDIC up to 250k. The state requires that we have an additional level of insurance, an additional million dollars above the 250 on the client account. Okay? So you've got insurance at the government level plus insurance that we have to carry. State gets a copy of that certificate of insurance. If that lapses for any reason, state says we're going to yank your license. Okay? Now you go beyond that and you say, okay, we have, we have to do daily reconciliation on all customer accounts. That gets rolled up into a monthly report and gets submitted to the FID, which is the Financial Institution Division, FID, of the state. That's how we're regulated. So that gets rolled up and they examine that, right? And so the, the thing that I tell people about it is, is that because of the insurance in place, Madoff didn't have insurance, and because of the examination, and that's, that's just the monthly reports. Then every 12 to 18 months, we go through what we call an annual examination or an audit. The state comes in, they sit in our office for a week. They go through all financials. They talk to employees. They you know, drink our coffee, eat our donuts, you know, that kind of thing. And um, they can ask anything they want. They can talk to anybody they want. They can look at anything they want. They have full discretion. That's the deal you make when you become a licensed institution. And so they come in and make sure that everything's done appropriately. And then at the end of that examination, they give you a score. And that's kind of how they manage. Those scores are not public, but what they do is they give you a score because if it, that's where they say, okay, somebody's kind of getting into trouble here. We need to step in and have them come up with a plan or, hey, they're sterling. We're just going to leave them alone. They're good to go. But there's a lot of oversight. There's a lot of insurance in place. And that's what provides you the protection that you get when you work with a financial institution. The thing though that I'll tell you that is the biggest benefit in my mind and the biggest protection you have on self-directed accounts is the fact that you're investing the money in things that you know and control. So as an example, you take Gary Thomas, he owns how many, I don't even know how many rental properties he owns inside that LLC. It's impossible for me or anyone in the company or anyone else to go take that property and run off to the Bahamas with it. Can't happen, right? I mean, it's impossible. So, so truthfully, what I tell people is our best protection for our, our account is to put it in real assets. But just know you have all that other oversight, examination, regulation, insurance in place overseeing your accounts and your cash. Cash poor. Right. Cash poor. Yeah, exactly. So if you have a million dollars insurance, but you have 50 million under control, that's a pretty small amount going to the individual people. Yeah, but Bob. It's per occurrence. My, my money. You know, I might have 200000 in my IRA account, but right now I've got 20000 cash in my IRA. You know, I mean, I've bought notes with it and real estate. And no, I know. I so it's, in the it's not like he's yeah. he has to get all of my money. money. You know? the, safest, the safest protection from him is to get the money invested somewhere. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. Or, or you, you have an investment. In, in Jack's case, to roll it into a trust, it's sitting in the corner. That's yeah, I mean, sitting in a bank that, that you choose, so, you know, but yeah. So, so there's a lot of protection there, and, and I think that's important for people to know. I mean, it's, 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 it's definitely something you want to be aware of. Yeah. I have a quick question just to differentiate. So um, this is something that Mike said. That you're, the money's sitting in either, is, when the money is in the assets and you're getting, the, you know, you're getting money rolling in every month, right? Is the money sitting in an account with, let's say, you know, the custodian the account that they make or an account that they have funneled money into, but it's, your, you, it's my account, for example? So the way it works, are, are, yeah, are you holding the we hold the account. So, so we are non-depository non bank. 
right? So the trust company licenses a non-depository bank. So we have several banking relationships, but the main one is as well as Fargo, okay? So the money sits at Wells Fargo, it doesn't sit with us. We hold it in what's called a pass-through account. So it's an account that's specifically set up for um, financial institutions or institutions that hold other clients' cash. So kind of like attorneys, right? They have their accounts where they'll hold client cash at times. It's not their own cash. It's for the benefit of an end client, but it's sitting in that, in that account. The end client, you, don't ha you have an account number, but you don't have a routing number, right? Like you do on your checking account, right? Because you, we can't allow a client to go in and out of that account, right? If you overdraw a quote your account, you're basically taking someone else's money. That's why, that's why it's set up this way. So it's basically an omnibus account is what we call it, but all the insurance is passed through to the individual accounts of the clients, and that's where the money is held, and it's sitting at, at basically Wells Fargo. Yep. So it's not like you have access to it. You, you, you know, the, 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 the custodian does not, you know, they, they don't have access to that, you know, that, that chunk of money that they no. can access the, the, in that way. You know, you correct. So, so there's a difference, there's a distinction between our operating account and the trust client, the client account or the trust account. So the trust account is what gets examined, audited, right? That's what the, that's what the government cares about. They want to make sure client money is protected. They don't care about our operating account, right? We can't spend a dime for any reason. We can't invest it, we can't spend it, we can't do anything with the money that's set in the trust account. Operating account, we can do whatever we want with, right? I mean, according to rules, you know, business rules and things like that, right? It's a business account, exactly. All right, thank you guys.